Okay. Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Indian Point Closure Task Force and Decommissioning oh Oversight I Board. Know, but here we are in person again. Supervisor Becker, thank you as always for hosting us. And to our friends uh, from the federal government in the audience, thank you for your continued support. I believe representatives from Senators Schumer and Gillibrand's office are with us in the audience, as well as folks from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to observe tonight's meeting. I note that we have a larger than usual audience tonight, um, including many folks who may be tuning in for the first time. So to orient you, this decommissioning oversight board is a bit unique. <coughs> it was created by the Department of Public Service and inspired by legislation introduced by Senator Harcum and Assemblywoman Galef, who is also with us. Welcome. Um, and um, it's, a, its purpose is to provide a forum for information sharing between involved agencies. It's also to identify issues for the relevant oversight agencies to address and to help inform the public about decommissioning and spent fuel management. As you will see when we do a roll call, we have membership that includes state agencies that either have oversight responsibility or play a role in working with the community to help transition the region following the closure of the plant. Local, county, state elected officials, labor representatives, an independent nuclear expert, and a member of the region's environmental community are also members of the board. The DOB is kind of a successor to the closure, Indian Point Closure Task Force, uh, which we convened by statute in 2017 following the announcement to close Indian Point. At that time, there was tremendous and understandable concern about the economic consequences of the plant's closure, the implications of our, for our energy grid, what it would mean for the tax base, and what it would mean for the many employees at the plant. And from the beginning, the state agency approach to the plant's closure was to commit to being a partner with local stakeholders, the local governments, to mitigate these impacts and to keep all of the state government assets engaged to work with our local partners all the way through decommissioning. I'm proud of what we've accomplished so far. Our time is limited, so I'm not going to go through each and every achievement, but a few things do stand out. We secured over $100 million in state funding to assist the school district village and town transition its local tax base. With the help of our state legislators, we strengthened worker protections and we strengthened DPS's oversight over decommissioned power plants. We have made more than $15 million in community environmental benefit awards. We hired a state resident inspector at the Department of Public Service to monitor deep decommissioning activities. We strengthen local building demolition permits to better, to, to have better enforcement mechanisms over dust control. And we're now working to develop a community monitoring program, which we'll hear more about later tonight. All of this really came out of the task force and DOB's core function, which is that we're a venue for information sharing. We accomplish these things because we listen. We listen to each other, we listen to the local stakeholders, we listen to the community, and based on that community feedback, we adjust our approach whenever warranted. We zero in on issues of concern in the community, and we try to be as transparent as possible. We answer every question that comes our way. If not on the spot, uh, we do it in writing before the subsequent meeting of our DOB. Um, and I think Senator Harcum can attest to this. Um, Thank you, Tom. Um, I just want to comment on, on one quick aspect. Part of the role that we have as elected officials is to interface with the community. Um, and I meet regularly with, with the activist community. We met just a couple weeks ago. We got a laundry list of items requests. Um, I sent a letter to the chairman. We just got the response back today. So I want to thank you for your very thorough and quick response. And a lot of the items that you suggested will be addressed by the oversight board as, as we go forward. So I, I want to thank you for that. I, I know not every every request is is doable, um, but but I want to thank you for your responsiveness and your speed. And I but I also want to thank the activist community for pushing and asking, insisting, um, and and that's how we move forward. So thank you. 
Thank you, Senator. And look, we're not perfect. There's always more that we can do to improve. Um, and Senator, we appreciate your efforts to work with the community, get us the feedback, but all of the elected officials really on the DOB have been tremendous partners and are regularly communicating what they're hearing on the ground from their constituents and, and that helps us be better. Um, and look, I mean, the, the amount of public comments that we receive and the range of viewpoints really continues to impress me. Um, and, and, it, and, and when I say there are a wide variety of views, I mean it. You know, we receive comments about, obviously, the continued environmental and, and public health concerns about radioactive waste, um, emergency preparedness and planning concerns. We receive a lot of comments as well about nuclear power and nuclear energy policy. And some comments have come in asking us to consider ways to restart the plant um, and to put it back to use in, in, in an effort to address climate change. And so clearly there's a wide variety of views. There's a lot of passion. Um, passions can definitely be high. And our approach as this decommissioning oversight board um, is to just recognize the reality of our situation. We're not here to talk about the pros and cons of nuclear energy. We are here recognizing that the plant is being decommissioned and that we need to seek factual answers to the community's questions with evidence citations, backup materials that we make available on our website. Um, we are science-based, we're technical-based, we're fact-based. Um, the state agencies with oversight responsibility have extremely dedicated staff working every day with a mission to protect public health and safety. Before I get on to the business of today's meeting, I, I also want to just recognize and thank Tom Kazmarek our uh, executive director of the De Decommissioning Oversight Board and the task force. Tom literally handles everything related to the DOB behind the scenes. Um, he ensures excellent coordination among the various state agencies involved in the effort. He meticulously keeps track of our commitments that we make to the community and holds us accountable to make sure that we follow through. And he answers substantive and logistical questions from members of the community and members of the DOB literally at all hours of the day and night. So these meetings just wouldn't be anywhere near as effective without Tom's leadership, and so we owe him our thanks. So um, next slide, please. Thank you. So we've got a lot to cover, as you can see, another full agenda. Um, you know, given the, the many newcomers to tonight's meeting, I asked Dave Lockbaum and Kelly Tuturo. Dave is our independent technical expert. Kelly Tuturo is the DEC Region 3 director on the DOB. We've asked them to give an overview explaining the difference between an operating nuclear power plant and one that's being decommissioned. We've gone over these presentations before to sort of set the stage for the work of the decommissioning oversight board and where we need to focus. Um, but I think given the, the um, the, the large number of newcomers to our process that it would be worthwhile to set the stage again. Um, we'll then break for a 30-minute uh, public statement hearing. I'm sorry, I might be skipping ahead, sorry. We're then going to have presentations regarding spent fuel pool water removal methods. This is an issue that is of uh, high interest in the local community. Um, folks understand that part of decommissioning means that you're gonna have to deal with the infrastructure that's on site that will no longer be there when decommissioning is complete. That includes the spent fuel pools. The water in the pools has been holding nuclear waste for a long time um, and so obviously has uh, some radioactivity that needs to be addressed before it can be safely handled and, 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 and uh, removed from the site. So the question are, what are the options for handling that? And we're going to hear from Dave Lockbaum um, some options analysis with pros and cons. And we will also be joined by some community guest speakers who I'll introduce soon, um, who will go over their perspective on the issues. Then we will have a 30-minute public statement hearing. Um, following the, the, the 30 minutes of public statements, we're going to go uh, back to DOB presentations where we will hear from Enbridge, which is the owner of the natural gas pipeline that runs in close proximity to the nuclear power plant um, and, and through the community, has been a subject of a lot of interest um, at previous meetings and was in the press in December. Uh, because there was a sinkhole that developed on the right-of-way about eight miles away from the plant, and um, we felt that it was worth their coming to explain what happened. We'll also have our DPS, Department of Public Service, uh, gas safety team 
uh, talk about that issue and some other pipeline updates. We will then hear from Holtec. Um, it's really important, I think, for the Decommissioning Oversight Board to regularly <coughs> hear from Holtec directly. Um, Holtec can provide us with a summary of activities uh, that has occurred at the site. They will also provide on a going forward what they expect over the next few months. Um, I've also asked Rich Baroni from Holtec to go into some detail about um, any NRC inspections and findings um, from those inspections. At the end of the last meeting from December, Richard Webster, our, um, our colleague, raised a concern about a, a citation they received, and we didn't have time at that meeting to get into it. So I really want to make sure we have time to hear about those issues. Um, we originally planned to then also have an agency oversight update. Um, there's just not enough time tonight. There were a lot of additional uh, requests for uh, speaking for, as part of our public statement hearing. We normally reserve 30 minutes a meeting. Um, we would never get through uh, all of the all of the all of the people who requested to speak in that amount of time. So we scrapped the agency update, but we did provide all of the DOB members with a written version of that, and we have already posted it on our website for all of you to see. Um, and then I added 30 minutes to our agenda uh, to try to accommodate as many of the people who pre-registered to speak as possible. So next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to get to the roll call. So um, I want to <coughs> welcome um, a couple of new members first before I dive in. Uh, welcome to uh, newly elected assembly member um, Dana Levenberg. Welcome. <laughs> Some big shoes to fill. <laughs> so welcome. Um, and we're also um, joined by Rachel Adler from the Department of Labor who filled in now for Jeff Goinup, who retired. So welcome to Rachel. Um, I'll just go through the roll call. Um, Supervisor Becker from Town of Cortland. Uh, Mayor Knickerbocker, Buchanan. Joe Hockrider from Hendrick Hudson School District. Is Catherine Borgia, County Legislator, thank you. Um, Colin Smith, I'm not sure if he's on virtually, not yet. Um, Senator Harcum. Yep. Assemblywoman Dana Levenberg. John Sipos, our counsel from DPS. Here. Tom Kazmarek, our executive director. Cliff Chapin, our resident inspector. Here. Kelly Tuturo from the DEC. Here. Rachel Adler. Here. David Lockbaum, our independent expert. Here. Richard Webster, our environmental rep. Yep. Yeah. Al Libtori from Teamsters. Here. Bill Smith from the UWUA. Here. Tom Carey, Westchester Putnam. Here. Hello. And on the line, did I miss anyone here at the table? Okay. Uh, Rich and we're joined by Rich Baroni. He's not a member of the DOB, but <laughs> welcome, Rich. Okay. We'll be hearing from Rich a little later. Um, and on the line, uh, if you can unmute, I'll call. For Westchester County, Dennis Del Borgo. Good evening, everyone. Tom Scaglione from Empire State Development. Good evening. Mark Pattison, Department of State. Good to see everybody. Mark Masseroni from Department of Taxation and Finance. Here. Jennifer Waka from Dishes. Good evening. Tony Hill from the New York Power Authority. Yeah, Elise. Hill. Thank you, Tony. Elise Peterson from NYSERDA. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Did I miss anyone from the DOB membership? OK, next slide, please. So just want to uh, remind folks, um, the in-person panelists who are here tonight, um, please remember to use this mic. That is how the court reporter will make sure we capture accurately the things that are said and develop a good transcript of tonight's meeting. All of the virtual panelists, if you have a speaking role tonight, please make sure you're muted unless you're speaking, and also remember to state your name before chiming in. All of the virtual participants in the audience who plan to speak during the public input portions of the agenda, you will be unmuted when it is your turn to speak. Um, and also for the folks in the audience, please reserve the chat feature just for technical issues. The chat feature in the Zoom that we use is not recorded, 
So if you have a substantive question, you should put that into the Q&A field in Zoom. And doing so will ensure that your question gets recorded. It will be reviewed and answered in writing before the next meeting of the DOB. OK, next slide, please. OK, we're going to dive into our presentations. Um, I want to um, introduce David Lockbaum, our independent nuclear expert, who, um, as I noted in the introduction, is going to just give a, an overview and a shortened version of some presentations he has made uh, along the way to orient, um, to orient the DOB as to current state of play with the decommissioning site and the monitoring networks that are in place today. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and just to show how lucky you were, the presentation of the board was not 91 slides. Tonight's only 13 slides, so <laughs> I'm giving you a break. During nuclear reactor operation, federal regulations limit how much radioactivity can be released to the air and water. Those regulations also require annual reporting on the airborne and liquid releases, as well as sampling performed offsite, as well as sampling performed offsite to guard against bioaccumulation of the materials that are released. The good news is that while the federal, reg limit, federal regulations remain constant after a plant permanently shuts down, the margins to those limits increase each passing day. Slide one helps explain why that's, that's the case. This chart is a little busy, but it'll be posted online. The rows are radionuclides like strontium-90, tritium, cesium-137, iodine-131. The, colum the columns are times since shutdown, starting with zero, going out to like 100 years. The green shaded bars are cases where radionuclides have decayed away. Ten half-lives, they're gone. The yellow vertical bars are units three, two, and one going from left to right, showing that a lot of the radionuclide inventories on those units has decayed away and can no longer be released simply because it's not there. Slide two shows the monitors that are installed to monitor airborne gaseous release pathways and waterborne release pathways. Those monitors will, if radi excessive radiation is detected, will cause the release path, the releases to be terminated. So you stay below the federal limits. Slide three shows- Dave, Dave, could I just ask a quick question on that slide? Sure. Those are all monitors that are in place even after the plant closed? I until there's no more radioactivity in that building. They, they remain active until there's no more need. Thank you. Slide three shows a map of 16 continuous radiation monitors that ring Indian Point and slide four shows some of the data that's available from those 16 continuous radiation monitors. DPS can access this data and get real-time data. It shows the 16 radiation readings as well as the wind speed and direction. <coughs> Slides five and six are pages from the annual reports that are submitted to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The radiation levels for the 2019, the last year that both units operated, units two and three, the radiation dose to the public was calculated to be 0.434 millirem, which is far below the 25 millirem fe federal limit. Slides seven and eight present data from Indian Point compared to, yeah, seven and eight radiation, I got it wrong. Pages, slide seven and eight are from an NRC report about radiation release from plants when they're operating and when they've permanently shut down. The average amount of radioactivity released to the air and water from decommissioning reactors was less than 40% of the radioactivity released from those same reactors when they were operating. <coughs> Again, that goes back to the first slide, there's just less radioactivity around. The only exception was tritium. Tritium released to the air from decommissioning plants was 92% of what it was when the plants were operating. Tritium is difficult to remove. Slide nine looks at the radiation releases from the Zion plant in Illinois, which is very similar to Indian Point, other than it shut down in 1996 instead of more recently. If you, the part on the left-hand side is when the plant was operating, the right-hand side shows when it was shut down. The blip in 2014, 15, and 16 is when they transferred fuel to the spent fuel pool. There have been no releases since the, essentially no releases since the fuel was transferred into dry storage. Next slide, please. 
this shows the same data for Yankee Row. Excuse me, Dave, could I just ask, these releases, would you, would you characterize those kinds of releases as the routine releases from an operating nuclear power plant? When you say releases, are these releases that were in compliance with the standards that NRC imposes on these plants? Were these releases that were somehow a, an accident of some kind that, that released the, the radiation into I, the, I got into the yeah, environment? These are routine releases that were reported annually to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in compliance with federal regulations. They're routine releases during reactor operation, as well as, the, as I said, the monitoring continues after the plant permanently shuts down. That's why you get data uh, after shutdown there. So it's, you continue to monitor up until the time the license is terminated after decommissioning is done. And Dave, are these, is this data from the, the um, monitors that are at the points of release on the site or from the site monitor, from the off-site monitoring? They're from neither. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Water tanks are sampled before the release to see what's in there. And you multiply what the concentrations of various isotopes by the volume that goes out to determine what's out there. Okay. The monitors make sure that no, there are no surprises. You didn't miss something. You didn't sample it. So it's the sampling of the water itself that determines what, the, what goes in those numbers, which is more accurate, by the way. Okay. Okay. Slide 12. So just, just to be sure, just the takeaway is that basically there are less routine releases during decommissioning, right? Yes, well, the, 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 the amount of reactivity in those releases is less. Right. By the way, I don't show it, but if you look at the worker doses, they also show that same correlation. That there's just less radioactivity, so the radiation doses to workers goes down as well. The next slide, please. These show the sampling points around Union Point where periodically samples are taken of aquatic wildlife, water, soil, and air. These are checks to make sure what the, what's going on at the building releases don't bioaccumulate. They also serve as a check to make sure if those monitors aren't working, these will pick it up at some point. So those are a backstop to the monitors that monitor the routine releases. And the next slide. As a back, as a, okay. as a further check, New York State also does monitoring independently of the company. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has its inspectors check what the workers are doing to make sure they don't, they don't monitor every activity, but they periodically monitor to make sure that the calculations are right, the numbers that the NRC gets annually are valid. So th those are pretty good checks that there's no surprises and no releases above federal limits or anywhere close to federal limits for that matter. That's all I've got, Tom. So Dave, sorry, for the, from the environmental program, what has that shown over the years? That's shown that the releases are small fractions of the federal limits. Um, right. Have there, have there been any accumulations that are of concern? Not, unfortunately, there have not been many. Uh, well, those data don't show any accumulation, okay. uh, significant accumulation. Um, no, so there's not been anything shown in, those, in that data. And that's also true elsewhere. That's not just Indian Point. Thank you, Dave. Next slide. I would like to ask Kelly Turturro from the DEC to walk through some updates. Um, we'll go back over the, the monitoring um, uh, work that the School Monitoring Working Group, which is a subset of these DOB members, as well as a number of agency personnel from other agencies, including the Department of Health, have been working on. So Kelly. Thank you, Tom. And as Tom mentioned um, to my fellow DOB members, this, much, much of this presentation is something you saw two meetings ago. Um, but we wanted to make sure that with additional community members here this evening, you were able to hear what the DOB was working on in terms of this um, school monitoring working group that was established back in during our first meeting of the Decommissioning Oversight Board in June 2021. So as you'll see here, um, our goals were to develop a better understanding of potential environmental and health risks that decommissioning could present at the BV school, to assess monitoring best practices, and to issue recommendations to the Hendrick Hudson School District. Next slide, please. So as a working group, we work to inventory those regulatory and monitoring pro protocols that are currently in place. 
All demolition work is subject to local demolition permits, state environmental regulations, strict workforce safety standards, and there is an on-site New York State inspector monitoring the work monitoring the work at the plant. Next slide, please. In addition, we found that there is a network of radiological monitors on site, on workers, and there are also 16 around the site perimeter, including two near the BV school. There are also on site dust control measures and off site dust complaint reporting and investigation procedures. In all cases, it's important to note that fugitive demolition dust must not leave the site. Next slide, please. During our work on the working group, we also consulted with state experts and found that on-site continuous air monitors in the immediate vicinity of demolition activity offer the most timely and beneficial information these provide early warning and near real-time results. We also learned that monitoring further out beyond the fence line may not be as useful for several reasons. There's a greater potential for interference from background readings. It's more difficult to determine the source and it doesn't account for long range transport of pollutants to the monitors. So I just want to take a minute to talk about heavy demolition. And, and we as a working group um, worked in terms of putting a plan, our goal was to put a plan in place in time for heavy demolition. And I just wanted to explain to everybody what, what does heavy demolition mean. So it's the demolition of concrete buildings with thick walls, like the spent fuel pool buildings, the turbine buildings, and the domes. Holtec has advised us that the timing for this heavy demolition on site would be late 2023, at the earliest. Next slide, please. So here's the, here's the update. Um, so what, what we did was, as I mentioned two meetings ago, we, we presented our findings as a working group. And um, one of those recommendations was to issue a rec request for proposals um, that would procure environmental consulting services to develop a community air monitoring plan. So working with our state agency partners, we put together an RFP, and that RFP was issued on January 9th of this year. We await responses. Um, as you can see here, we have a timeline for next steps. So our proposal deadline is March, and, and then we will work from there. Um, Tom, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to add um, a little bit. Um, I've, I've spoken with a, a few members in the local community to better understand um, ongoing concerns that parents may have. I've, I've heard uh, that some parents in the, in the school community would like to have more access to experts and be able to um, interact and, and ask questions of, of our experts. And um, so I've spoken with so Superintendent Hockrider and, and we've agreed that we'll take the, the working group that we've established as part of the DOB and um, have a number of additional meetings of the working group in the school community, working together with the school district and the local PTO to make sure we invite all the relevant uh, families who, who want to come and be a part of a public forum where we'll give updates on the camp um, activities and, and our, pro our, our progress there, but also make available the experts involved in developing the camp. Eventually, when we have the consultant, including the consultant, um, Dave would be a part of that. Um, as well as members of uh, staff at DEC and DOH um, and our own agency, the DPS. So um, we look forward to having those um, and having an exchange with uh, the families um, attending the school and, and making sure that we are addressing the concerns and answering the questions that they have. Tom, Joe, yes. Quick, quick, can I quick question for you? Um, I used to do this stuff years ago. And one of the things we used to try to do is have a, a baseline prior to the activity commencing um, so that you know you can tell you can set limits action limits in advance of the activity um, commencing it seems like here the 
monitoring program is going to commence pretty tight on the activity commencing. So what's the plan for a baseline? Are you just going to take readings when the wind's blowing the other way? Readings when the wind's blowing the other way? I mean, in other words, how do you, when you, when you get the readings, how do you know, how do you know, well, how do you know what, normally I, we used to use the baseline to set the action limits, right? So a few things. Um, once we get the environmental consultant on board, um, we will be talking to them about um, gathering as much information as they can to determine that baseline. There is a lot of information that is currently collected, um, uh, both on site, um, through the Reuter Stokes monitors that are around the property. We have many monitors around um, in, inside the fence line as well as just outside the fence line. So we will be working with our environmental consultant to, to be putting all that information together. But you also have dust, for instance? We also have dust. Do you have, like, measurements of particulates in the air? <coughs> There is monitor. There are monitoring networks in within the fence line at um, at the Holtec site. Yeah. Rich, can you talk to that? Well, this is Rich Brony. We have continuous air monitors and continuous air samplers within the property itself. If that's what we're asking. But the continuous. And, and we did work with the DEC on uh, dust mitigation controls for our, for our demolition permits. So we're not allowed, right, to um, trans transport any dust beyond the site boundary. And that's written in the rule. We work with the DEC. We work with the village of Buchanan, Pete Cook. Right, so that's all on our DCOM work permits. Right. right. So it's, it's, a, it's a belts and suspenders right. approach here. Okay. So we've got the on-site inspector. We've got the dust control mitigation measures. There's the monitors on site. We're going to set up the ring line fence monitors as well. Right. Um, but your point is taken with respect to the sites off-site and it's understood in the scope that baselines would have to be established by the consultant. Right. I'm just saying, though, if we, if we get too tied up against the commencement of activity, it makes gathering a baseline very hard. It, it, in other words, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're six months ahead, if, you're, if you set up your monitoring network yeah. six months ahead of the heavy demolition, mm -hmm. then you have six months to get a baseline, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you set up two weeks before the start of heavy demolition, then yeah. you only have two weeks of baseline. Yeah. And especially if that is around December when the schools break, mm -hmm. I think you might see um, a, an invalid baseline. Well, those would all be factors that would have to be considered by the consultant. And, you know, we can have that discussion with them, with the working group. Right. But uh, I guess what I'm saying, Tom, is that December doesn't look like a great time to commit. Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing the best we can, and we'll have them on, online as, as quickly as we possibly can. If we can beat the schedule, we will. Wait, right. To, to, that could help somewhat. We do have air sampling units outside the plant, within two miles and, and beyond two miles. Mm -hmm. So we could look at that data and set up a baseline. And the D DOH has air, air monitors as well, and so we'll pull everything that's obviously already in existence, of right. course. Okay, next slide. So we want to move on now to um, the topic of today's presentations. Um, and we're going to begin um, with our community guest speakers. And I want to introduce Michelle Lee, an attorney by training. She works in a pro bono advocacy capacity with a number of environmental groups in New York and is speaking here as a member of the United for Clean Energy. Michelle serves on the board of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, an industry watchdog organization based in the Washington, D.C. area. She's a member of the Nuclear Consulting Group, an international inter interdisciplinary think tank with focuses on a wide variety of issues which intersect with nuclear matters, including public health, safety, and security. Michelle is also joined by Dr. Kathy Falvo, who is a retired pediatrician. During her career, she was professor and chair of global public health at the New York Medical College School of Public Health in Valhalla and an adjunct professor of pediatrics at New York Medical College. She also worked as a chief pediatrician at the Family Neighborhood Health Center in Ossining. In addition, she served as assistant director of the Child and Youth Project at the Roosevelt Hospital in New York City and from 2011 to 2013 as the president of Doctors for the Environment. So with that, I'll turn it over to Michelle, who is joining us via Zoom. Michelle? 
Yes, I'm trying to, oh, I don't see anything on my screen that allows me to get in. We see your slide and we can hear you. All right. Um, all right. Well, I'm not sure if there's a camera, but I just. <laughs> if the audio visual tech support could I'm sorry Michelle I'm sorry to interrupt oh, you I, I'm sorry we're, we're getting a little bit of an echo so we're gonna yeah. first ask our audio visual team to uh, assist if you'll just bear with us one moment hi there um, I think we were going to have Okay, and, and the echo is improving, so um, Kathy, you'd be welcome to go ahead and get started. Um, okay, except you have to give me one, one minute, two seconds. Okay, we have the video and we have that, and I just have to find my crib notes. Oh. Okay, Dr. Favreau, we'll give this another shot. Go ahead and please begin. Okay. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was, if I use terminology which you don't, somebody in the audience doesn't understand, please ask. Um, four years of medical school and a whole lot of time after that, I learned an entirely new language, and I forget what's medicine and what's English. Um, so if you need clarifications, pop it in the questions or somewhere. Now, what I'm going to say, when we're talking about regulations, almost all of them are based on an average human male, age 30, 70 kilo. Um, this is not the audience and the population we're really talking about for something like decommissioning, because the people at highest risk from the radiation are not 30-year-old men, unless they're actually in the industry inside, but are the fetuses, the kids, and the, wim the women or people who might be pregnant and are pregnant, who are at greater risk from radiation and any other toxic in the environment. And so, we have to keep in mind that kids, particularly kids, are really different. They're not <coughs> miniature-sized adults. Uh, and so when we're talking about decommissioning and what's a problem or not problem, we have to be very careful that when we're looking at regulations, we're remembering that they usually generally don't apply to the people of interest. Now, the other thing about people, any of them at any age, is that while most of us are very much alike, uh, which is how we can do medicine, we can say, this looks like pneumonia, and this is how you treat it, and it usually works. But there is nothing about humans that are absolutely similar across the line in any way, even so-called normal, meaning they're like usual five-year-old, are different, are some the same and very generally very different. Uh, so that when we're setting regulatory levels for kids, we need to be very careful to leave lots of leeway about how vulnerable they are. They breathe more air for body weight than adults do. They drink much more water and consume more food than adults do for their body size. And that's because they're growing. And if we damage them, it's you know potentially 70 or 80 or 90 years of damage. Um, somebody does something that damages me, it's not going to last real long, because I'm not going to last real long. But hopefully the kids will. And fetuses have particular times when they're very much more vulnerable than other times. So that you really can't say, well, you know, they're past, the pregnant person is past some time period and so we don't need to worry. That's not true. Sometimes earlier in pregnancy is more worrisome, but the whole pregnancy is worrisome in terms of 
potential damage from environmental things. Dr. Falvo, Dr. Falvo, if I could just, I'm sorry to interrupt again. The That's echo it. has returned, and so I'm, I'm going to ask you to pause a moment and ask our audio team to see if they can correct the issue again. Okay. Could you do a test one, two closer to the computer, please? Uh, test one, two, yes. three, four. <laughs> That's much better, much better. I think we're getting closer to being able to, to begin again. If um, the audience could please uh, quiet down so we can restart the presentation. Okay, are we ready? Dr. Falvo, you are a saint, and I really appreciate your patience. <laughs> Go ahead and please restart. Okay, so I'm not sure what anyone knows about radiation as such, so I'm going to give it what I hope is a half a minute or maybe a minute. Tritium is, in terms of decommissioning and what we're going to do with tritium, which is to say the wastewater, um, is the issue at hand that I was asked to talk about. But radiation comes in four different several different forms, but four of note for this is alpha and beta, which are very, act very close and are not very strong. So they don't go through aluminum, they don't go through your skin, um, at least not very much. But if you breathe them in or eat them in, they're sitting right there on the surface of the cells in the lung and the gut. So they're a problem, not when they're floating in the air, but otherwise. Gamma and X-ray are much more penetrating, um, and that's not what we're talking about now, so it, that's not really um, an issue. But the way you approach them is very different. Uh, so the alpha and the beta, since they are very close, you have to treat, act sort of like the a bullet of, shot, of a shotgun. In other words, they send very weak scatter of radiation, while the gamma and the x-ray are more like a rifle bullet. They go moving straight ahead through. What this means is that if you protect yourself from breathing and eating, uh, you're not going to be bothered by the tritium in the wastewater, but that's not what happens, is it? Uh, water gets into the river, it gets, it evaporates into the air, it dilutes out some, but it's still there, and very much like a shotgun bullet, you know, if you, you get hit, usually it's not gonna hurt a human a whole lot, but it can hit a vulnerable thing like your eye and really cause havoc. And we don't know. So you want to be cautious about going, well, it's not very dangerous, so we're not going to worry. Because not very dangerous and no danger are vastly different affairs in human health. Now, <coughs> tritium comes from two sources. The major one is pepper plants, but the other one is forms in the atmosphere and comes down in rain, snow, hail, sleet. And so when we say Indian Point's not going to add a lot of tritium, however we dispose of the wastewater, it's adding to, it's got a half-life of 12.3 years, I guess, which means that half of it disappears and then in another 12 years, another half of that half or the next quarter disappears. And 12 and a half years is not, you know, the high level radiation things that last for hundreds and thousands of years. But 12 years is a pretty long time, particularly for a developing fetus in the kid. And we add to that all the unknowns of all the other kind of radiation, some of which will end up targeting the same thing that tritium does, and some of it which will target other things. We don't know anything about cumulative effects 
different levels and the cumulative effects of varying radiations that hit us, much less those effects for some of the to other toxins around. And so we really need to try and minimize them as much as possible anywhere. Uh, which gets us to what are we going to do with the tritium at Indian Point? And in medicine, and particularly in pediatrics, we like to use what we call the precautionary principle, which has a whole lot of different meanings, but what it basically gets down to is how much benefit and are we going to get from doing something? In this case, either emptying the tanks, the tritium water into the river or evaporating it off into the air would be, be probably the two most reasonable ones to think about. And what's the, what's the harm? Now the benefit is we get rid of it, we clear off the land, it can get used for something else. The hazard is much of it we don't know, but it certainly will increase certain number of cancers and other things that nobody looks at. Um, one of the, I asked the question of a friend of mine who looks at power plant radiation, has anyone looked at things like diabetes? Because as a pediatrician, we've always had fat kids, but we've never really had fat kids with type 2 diabetes. And all of a sudden, they're all over the place. So is this something from power plants? Is it something from other things in the environment? Is it just a genetic mutation that took place for other reasons? Um, and one of the maybe data that came out of Chernobyl was that there's an increase in type 1 diabetes, which is not type 2. But they're both, you lose, your pancreas loses its ability to produce either any insulin or insufficient. So there, along with the cancer risks, which we do know a fair amount about, although not everything we'd like, we know nothing at all about chronic disease risks from radiation, or pretty much nothing. And so I think when we're figuring out what to do at Indian Point or any other nuclear power plant, I mean, my first thing would be just don't produce any more because we don't know what to do with the leftovers. But we have to consider which would be the least damaging. My own feeling is, one of my questions for everybody is, how long before, once the plant is completely decommissioned, is that land going to lay empty before something is put in there? Because if it's going to lay empty for a while, one of the options, which is not discussed anywhere, is just leaving everything as it is until the tanks start to leak, in which case we must do something, or until we're really ready to <coughs> proceed to use the land. Because until we have some serious use for the land, there's no reason to take the plant apart at all and add these risks. And it's just possible somebody will find a, a solution to what to do with this that's safer in terms of public health than either letting the tritium into the water or into the air. I think that's all I have to say, actually. Thank you so much, Dr. Fellow. Guys, getting a little feedback, obviously. In Unless somebody's got some basic questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Fowler, and thank you for your patience and bearing with us with the technical challenges. Um, we we heard you loud and clear for the second half of your of your of your presentation, and it was very informative, and we really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to Michelle Lee uh, to say a few words. Michelle. Lockbaum's presentation made me recall uh, an experience I had when I was uh, a very young lawyer and I was working very late at my law firm and the last associate at, at there, and I worked at a, a large firm in New York City 
and the senior partner was running around uh, frantically trying to find somebody to do research on asbestos, what the impacts of asbestos were, because a large, big client of ours uh, wanted to know how much exposure um, was, was allowable in the regulation. So the partner found me, and I ended up spending an all-nighter and, and going into the congressional record. And I was young and naive and idealistic and rather appalled to find out uh, that what regulations are based on is what the balancing of cost-benefit is for industry versus human health and the environment. Yes. And yes. the question really boils down to how many people are, is it okay to kill or make sick? And that's exactly what we have with the new regulations for radioactivity in this country. So, the National Academy of Sciences came out with a very, uh, very important report in 2022. Um, it was called Leveraging Advances in Modern Science to Revitalize Low-Dose Radiation Research in the United States. That's a mouthful. So let me just read some of the conclusions of this report. Low dose and low dose rate radiation effects on human health outcomes and the biological mechanisms of these effects are not fully understood. There is increasing evidence that low dose radiation exposure may be associated with non-cancer health outcomes such as cardiovascular disease, neurological disorders, immune dysfunctions, and then it goes on. Radiation exposures, like many stresses and injuries, get relayed in vivo through shared pathways, especially along the danger sensing and inflammatory immune signaling cascades that are open to amplification and exacerbation over time. So what does that mean? It, and, and, I, and I won't go on and on and on, um, but basically that means that the, the regulatory scheme, which not only was focused primarily and derived from young white men aged 20 to 30, which were the Manhattan Project workers, they weren't women, they weren't children, they weren't babies, they weren't babies in utero, they were young, healthy white men. That scheme is still what's in place, and I will read the quote from the NAS report. The US NRC's regulations for protection against radiation are still based primarily on scientific publications issued in the 1970s. Well, I'm sorry, but there's been a lot of medical development since the 1970s. There have been whole disciplines that have come into being since the 1970s, you know, particularly with respect to understanding cellular signaling mechanisms and, and me mechanisms that, that introduce or exacerbate disease beyond the simple metric of the issue of cancer. And, the, and those um, effects, which, which in literature are now being called non-targeted effects, are, con are considered particularly worrisome with low-level radiation, even more so than high-level doses, for the simple reason that if you have a high dose of ra radiation, you, your body has a tends to kill off the cells. You know, you do have cell mutations and that can, can lead to cancer, and the cancer risks are far higher for windows of vulnerability and for vulnerable populations. But, but when, if you have a cell death, the cell's gone. When you have low dose radiation, especially something like tritium, which again is a beta emitter, which, which live, doesn't deliver its energy far, so it's just delivering its energy into the cells of the body, into, the, into that near area of the cell. What you can have is not necessarily cell death or apoptosis, 
but you have a cell that's now in stress and it's signaling to the other cells in the body. And, and this is a, a now a recognized major initiation for a, a whole host of chronic diseases. None of that is considered by the regulation. The regulations do not focus on internal emitters, right? They focus primarily on what people, again, what the, the Manhattan Project workers were exposed to, which is gamma radiation, which is rays. So with tritium, it's water. It's radioactive <coughs> water. If you ingest it, it goes into your body, it goes into every cell that water goes into, so that obviously includes the eyes, the mouth, the heart, uh, the, the, the ovaries, the testes, the fetus, it goes through the umbilical cord. For pregnant women, it's in the breast milk. Uh, so these are not inconsequential risks, and they're not assessed risks. Uh, so, I, I, and with all due respect, the regulations are based almost exclusively on reported releases. So that means that they're not independently validated over the years. This slide that I have up is um, a slide from the NRC. Uh, which related to an issue that, that uh, many of you uh, are aware of, but some of you may not be, uh, which is legacy leaks uh, that were going on in the, into the groundwater at Indian Point. Uh, so the regulations and the inspections did not pick up these leaks um, for years and years and years. They were going, they were basically leaching out of, of two different spent fuel pools, creating two plumes that eventually joined into one plume. And, and those releases aren't considered in natural effluent reports because the, the reactor operators don't report things like that, right? Uh, it became evident because uh, it was basically found out by happenstance at Indian Point, and then there were years and years of, uh, you know, it, of investigation, and New York is, is well aware of this. Um, and ultimately, the report that was conducted by GCA, uh, which was contracted for by the operating plant Energy, uh, determined that the solution to the to the releases that were going down under the plant into the groundwater, into the Hudson River, um, that the way to resolve that is by natural attenuation, which basically just means it goes into the Hudson River and, you know, we shrug our shoulders. So there, you also have the releases that are going to be continuing for God knows how many years from many, many buried systems, including piping, that is not that cannot be um, identified <coughs> because it's buried deep down. A lot of this piping carries radioactive water, but it's not was not considered essential to the safety system of the plant that would prevent the meltdown. So the NRC regulations did not require those pipes to be able to be inspected. And that, that, that piping is, going, is there. Nobody has an idea how much of, of that piping is going to be leaking. Some of it is, is going to be underneath the structures at the site. So the question we have here with respect to the release of the radioactive water, which is primarily in the spent fuel pools, and will not just be limited to tritium, but will include a host of other contaminants that, that are in the, in the uh, spent fuel. And while much of it may be able to be uh, it, it, it taken out by resins and, and treated, not all of it is. So the question is, all of that radioactivity is right now contained. It doesn't have to be released. It can be kept on site, whether that is through tanks, or through keeping it in the spent fuel pool. And in other words, doing the treatment and then putting it back into the spent fuel pool. You know, those are options that, and from my perspective and from the perspective of from the public health and the environment, I think is the, the precautionary approach 
and it's a way to save to our community. Uh, and let me just add that this is a community that is an environmental justice community. Uh, Peak Skill is in, in, in the Buchanan area um, are the sites of, of, of old industrial facilities. And there was a study, let's see, uh, done in 2010. Uh, oh wait, I'm looking at the wrong thing in one minute. It's called um, the Community-Based Environmental Justice Inventory. So that was conducted by Peaceville Environmental Justice Council, Clearwater, and Citizens for Equal Protection, Environmental Protection. Um, and it identified many, many prominent sources of pollution within the Peaksville area. So that includes, the, what was, uh, I won't read through the whole list, but it's a number of them, including Wheelabrator, which is a, a municipal solid waste resource recovery facility uh, that burns all of Westchester County's garbage. And, and it's, it's characterized in, by New York as a toxic release facility. So when you're looking at what the impacts on the, the Hudson River, which is a polluted river, New York has done, you know, try, worked for years, for decades, <coughs> trying to clean it up. But it's, it's a, a super fun site because the PCB pollution <coughs> from decades ago. Uh, See, so what you have to really consider is the cumulative impacts uh, on humans and on the river of all of the radionuclides that have been released, legacy radionuclides, radionuclides that, that Holtec wants to release into the Hudson in, over the next couple of years, and all the future releases that are, gonna, that are basically still leaching down, down below the site, and go all being directed into the Hudson River. And, and so if your kid is swimming and playing along the shoreline, or you have people fishing, a lot of people fishing for substance um, food, somebody's gonna be catching the wrong fish and feeding it to their family. Some little girl is gonna be swimming and taking the wrong gulp of water, and the DOB can prevent that. You know, I really think this is the time for the DOB to step up, to say stop, it's not necessary to release the, this water. Uh, it's a benefit to Holtec because they are, can make more profit to do it cheaply, right? Uh, but Holtec took $2.3 billion, which was in the trust fund, that New York ratepayers pay for the decommissioning and cleanup of this site. And the leftover money from decommissioning and, and waste storage was supposed to go back to the ratepayers. But it's not going back to the ratepayers, it's gonna be pocketed by Holta. So the cost benefit analysis here is all of the cost for any kind of damage to the environment or to human beings from dumping more radioactive contaminated water and, and chemically contaminated water into the Hudson, all the cost goes on to the public and all the benefit would go to Holtec. And to my mind, that is not a public policy that should be allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I really, really appreciate your patience with us with the technical problems. We heard you loud and clear, and we really appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to turn it to Dave Lockbaum. Um, Dave, as folks know, is our independent nuclear engineer um, expert on the, on the uh, DOB. Um, and Dave has also looked into this issue of what to do with the uh, cooling water um, and has a presentation. Go ahead, Dave. I looked at four options that have been used in the past to dispose of or handle radioactively contaminated water. Slide three is where I'll start. As this table shows, over the last 17 years, 99.99% of the radioactivity released to the water has been tritium. The other materials have been 
largely filtered out or, or demineralized out. Slide four just should provide some basic information about tritium. Tritium is an isotope of hydrogen. A normal hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. Tritium is a hydrogen isotope that has one electron, one proton, and two neutrons. That isotope is unstable, and tritium seeks stability by emitting a beta particle, as others have said. A water molecule consists of two hydrogen and one oxygen atom. Either or both of those hydrogen atoms in a water molecule could be tritium. Tritium is the primary const component of radioactive releases to the water because it is very difficult to remove by filters and demineralizers that are, that are used to clean up other water before it's discharged. Slide five shows that tritium has a half-life of 12.3 years. Half-life means if you have 100 units of tritium today, 12.3 years from now you'll have 50 units and 25 years, 25 units after 24.6 years and so on. <coughs> slide six is a busy slide, but it shows EPA's limits on, dr on radioactivity in drinking water. For example, tritium's limit is 20,000 picocuries per liter, while strontium-90's limit is eight picocuries per liter, and the limit for iodine-131 is only three picocuries per liter. Slide seven tries to explain why radionuclides have different limits. Tritium has a half-life far longer than its residence time in the body. So the, the bullets, whether they're shotguns, as Dr. Falvo said, or, or rifle bullets, they're, it, they're not in the body when, when those rifle shots or shotgun shells go out, because it's in the body for a month versus 12.3 years for those ammo to be discharged. Whereas iodine-131 could be absorbed by the thyroid and stay in the body for far longer. So that because its residence time in the body is longer, EPA imposes a lower limit to manage that hazard during that time. <coughs> and I, like I said, slide eight basically lists the four options I looked at that have been used in the past. And I tried to look at what are the pros and cons of each of those four options. The four options I looked at were discharge to the river, evaporation into the air, shipment off-site for burial, and on-site storage until the radioactivity decays away. Slides 9 and 10 try to convey the fact that in all four options, the water is treated before it goes into the river, or goes into the air, goes into a place out in Idaho or whatever. It's not just packaged up and, and sent out. It's treated and then one of those four options takes place. Slide 12 and Appendix B provide the amounts of radioactivity, amounts of tritium that have been discharged from Indian Point and other pressurized water reactors. Indian Point has high, typically has higher amounts of tritium released to the water because Indian Point units are typically larger than many other plants, and therefore they use more water and generate more tritium that must be handled in some fashion. Slides 13 through 15 are from the annual reports that must be submitted to the NRC by each plant owner. And they show that the federal limits, there are a lot of federal limits on radiation. The NRC's federal limit is three millirem to the public from radioactivity released to the water. EPA has a limit of 25 millirem from all sources, water, air, and so on. And so it's kind of difficult to navigate all the speed limit signs that the federal government puts up on radiation. In the past, as slides 16 and 17 show, over 150,000 gallons of radioactively contaminated water was discharged into Long Island Sound from the Shoreham nuclear plant after its brief cameo appearance as a nuclear power plant. <laughs> slides 18 to 20 explain how the spent fuel pool water from the Unit 1 reactor at Indian Point was discharged to the Hudson River after all of its fuel was removed from the pool, moved into dry storage. Slide 21 cites a, an NRC response to Ulster County Legislature last <coughs> November that basically says that the federal government, either EPA or NRC, has jurisdiction over radioactivity released to the air and water. Having said that, slide 22 then explains why Pilgrim has different rules. Pilgrim's a nuclear power plant in Massachusetts where discharge of this 
spent fuel pool water may not be an option. The state uh, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Open Protection and the EPA issued a water permit in January 2020 that disallowed discharge of spent fuel pool water into the bay. That's if tritium is considered a pollutant, which folks up there believe it is. Slide 23 in Appendix D to my slideshow basically show that the terms and conditions of the agreements for the closure of in Indian Point and the transfer of the ownership from Entergy to Holtec retained the discharge permit that had been used for four decades that allows spent fuel pool water to be discharged as it was from Unit 1. Slides 24 and 25 attempt to show how the owners determine and NRC inspectors verify that the release limits are met. It's a fairly complicated calculation and in my career I'm glad I never had to do that because I never got paid enough to do those calculations. Slides 26 through 28. One of the things that, that was raised by Do Dr. Falvo, and I, in my research I went to the same place, was bioaccumulation. You're releasing tritium largely. Is it accumulating in algae and then crustaceans and fish and, and then humans? And I didn't find many reports on that. There was a Canadian study and a French study that looked at it and said that because bioaccumulation is not properly accounted for in the regulations, the health consequences could be 10 times higher than are established by the current limits. So I, I don't know one way or the other. That was a Canadian study that said it may be the limits. The bioaccumulation is, makes things 10 times worse than, than uh, estimated. So in slides 29 and 30, I said, well, if it is 10 times higher, does that put the releases from Indian Point above the federal limits? And what it sh the data shows is that there's still less than, even if you multiply them by 10, there's still less than 5% of the federal limit. Slide 31 then summarizes the pros and cons of discharging the water to the river. Slide 30, the example I used for evaporation of, to the air was Three Mile Island. Uh, there was a, the city of Lancaster got an injunction that prevented that owner from discharging radioactive contaminated water to the Susquehanna River. So the company brought in this device that evaporated at five gallons per minute into the air. And it wasn't a little bit of water, it was like two and a half million gallons of water generated by that accident. And slides 34 and 35 show that that two and a half million gallons contained quite a bit of radioactivity, um, all forms, because the fuel, the, the core melted down and fuel, radioactivity that used to be in the spent, and the fuel was now in the water. One of the things that uh, was learned from, well, it was known before, but it was demonstrated by Three Mile Island, was that anything that's evaporated there can fall right back down to the ground in rainfall, get into the Susquehanna River or into the land and around the plant. S slide 39 cites a 1987 study by the Nans National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements that looked at evaporation versus just discharging it to the river. They said the dose to the public from the evaporation was about 300 times higher than if you just discharged it to the river. 300 times higher. Slide 41 provides the pros and cons of the evaporation method. I'm not a big fan of evaporation. Slide 45 showed another example that was used at Vermont Yankee where about the same amount, about 2 million gallons was shipped to Idaho and buried in Idaho near a city called Grandview. Um, 250,000 gallons came from the spent fuel pool. Nine times as much came from the suppression pool. Vermont Yankee is a boiling water reactor. It has a suppression pool. Indian Point does not have, but Indian Point has other tanks and other structures that hold contaminated water in addition to the spent fuel pool. Slide 49 uh, showed that the NRC does not consider the potential dose to the public from transport of two million gallons. It wasn't one tanker car. It was over a hundred tanker cars to get that water to Idaho. The NRC assumes there's zero risk. They didn't even look at it, so they didn't calculate what the risk may or may not have been. Once it got to Idaho, slide 50 shows that the estimated dose to the public was 1.5 millirem per year, which is far below the EPA limit. But slide 51 shows that that 1.5 millirem is 483 to 770 times higher than the dose to the public from releases to the Hudson River by Indian Point over the years, 2005 to 2019. 
And slide 52 poses the question of whether burying Indian Point's contaminated water in Idaho poses an environmental injustice issue. Slide 53 provides the pros and cons of transport for burial option. For the storage on site example, I, the most recent example is Fukushima when its accident in 2011 provided a, a uh, use of tanks, lots and lots of tanks for storing contaminated water. Slide 56 showed the plant before the accident. Slide 57 shows after the accident. I wish I was in the tank selling business because I would have made a fortune on all those tanks that were built up there in the upper part of the tank. Slide 59 shows that it took, didn't take very long at all, less than 30 months for those tanks to leak and have water find its way into the Pacific Ocean. The more tanks you have, the more likely you are to have leaks. Fact of life. Slide 61 and Appendix C show that this isn't just a Japanese problem. Here in the United States, we've had all kinds of problems with tanks that have leaked. Vermont Yankee, before it shut down, leaked 180, excuse me, leaked 83,000 gallons of contaminated water into the Connecticut River. Over 11,000 gallons leaked from a, a storage tank in St. Lucie in Florida and so on. Um, tanks, tanks are not very good for storing water for any period of time. Slide 65 in Appendix D would also tend to suggest that long-term storage of contaminated water on site is contrary to the explicit language of the Public Service Commission order authorizing transfer of Indian Point from Entergy to Holtec. Entergy was planning to wait five decades before they began decommissioning the site. Holtec proposed a more rapid schedule. The PSC order found that timely decommissioning and site restoration was, quote, unquestionably in the public interest, end quote. Slide 68 provides the pros and cons of on-site storage of contaminated water. Slide 69 goes back and lists the four options again. All four options have been used. No option, none of these four options is risk-free. And also, none of the options is so risky that it couldn't be used again. But of the four options, I personally believe that the discharge to the river is the, is the best way to manage the hazard that is present to harm as few people as possible. Um, but I also realize that that's just one vote. But that's, that'd be my vote. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. I want to open it up um, to the DOB members if there are any questions from any of the presenters, Michelle, Dr. Fallow, or, or, or Dave Lockbaum. Yes, Richard. Yeah, I mean, so I want to just explore this um, two issues, actually. One is the bioaccumulation issue. I want to see if Dr. Falvo agrees with, with Dave that uh, we, we, we don't have great data on that, both either pro or con. And then the second issue is what does, what does Dr. Falvo think about storage on site? And for Dave, for the volumes that are leaked out of tanks, surely that's a lot less than the whole amount, right? So. Those are the questions. So maybe we start with Dr. Falvo, yeah. um, if we can attempt <laughs> for uh, another audio experience. Dr. Falvo, are you with us? And, and I think the question from Richard Webster um, is what your views are based on Mr. Lockbaum's presentation on the fact that tanks can leak, um, and indeed the, uh, the fact of the spent fuel pool water having leaked in the past. Um, and also the bioaccumulation. And, and, and also the bioaccumulation aspects. But w Dr. Favo's views on tank storage on site. Dr. Favo? I believe Dr. Favo is muted. Am I unmuted now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. As far, I think storing on site unless we have something really, really useful for the land for a while, is may give us an answer that's better than what we have now. Hopefully somebody out there or somebody's, because this is going to be a group effort, are actually looking at other ways than those who already have to deal with this issue. Because 
Indian points here, we, the US has a moderate number in terms of world nuclear power plants. France has many more than we do as far as I understand. And so this is something that not only do we have to answer for Indian Point, but needs an answer for the world. And so hopefully it's being looked at and if we can sit tight for a while, even if they leak a little bit, it's less than what's gonna, a big dump, and see what happens and balance the two. When we have a really good land use proposal and how it's gonna be done, <coughs> Not just it'd be a good idea to put up um, solar panels, but an actual plan of how to do that, which will work the most efficient way. And the tanks start leaking more than a drop or two. Then we can look at the options at that moment and decide what to do. But it doesn't seem to me, even though all do haste, um, has been decreed by the state that all due haste means net right now, today. And dumping that much water into the Hudson, which is already thoroughly polluted, along with everything that's coming out of the sky in terms of tritium, does not seem like the best idea for human health. I certainly would not want to see us shipping it. Um, the dangers of shipping are way too great. And it's not very fair to dump it all in Idaho or anywhere else when we've created the problem for ourselves. Um, they may think it's a good idea because they get some money out of it, but I, that should not be the main focus. Right, and then Th thank you, Dr. Bob. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Richard, sorry. Yeah, Kathy, a quick word on bioaccumulation of tritium. Are you, in the same camp as Dave, uh, unknown or at the moment? It, it's, it's mostly unknown other than, I think, two things. One, if it's left floating around and it hits into hard objects like steel, it changes the radiation picture entirely, not for the better. But it seems that it really will bioaccumulate in a more toxic form when it ends up in the bottom of the river and it will fall, it will end up there in some fashion or other in part. And clearly all these things bioaccumulate, although whether the repeated exposures cause cancer or something else, I don't think we have a clue at the moment. Thank you. There's a Another part to the question to Dave, and then I think Senator Harcum has a question next. Go ahead. The question was, the, ta the leaks from the tanks have been pretty small. I would cite Oyster Creek, which put 130,000 gallons into Barnegat Bay. Every shift they recorded the water inventory. They saw it drop quite a bit, and they said, that must be wrong. So they just changed the math, just radio forward the previous shift's number until half the tank was then in the bay. Um, New Jersey was not real happy about that, but uh, so yeah, it's it can happen. Um, I don't know where those guys are today, but it can happen <laughs> again. Okay. Senator Harcum, thank you very much. This is a, a general question. I don't I don't know that anyone necessarily has the answer right now, but <clears throat> according to the slide, um, when Indian Point One was taken offline, that water was treated and released into the Hudson. Um, do we know if anyone did any sampling or took data, the NRC, the EPA, DEC? Can we access that data and what did it show? The, the data does exist. I have looked at it. It, it was in one of my slides. Um, I forget what the numbers are, but there was, it did show an increase when that water went out from, from Unit 1. But it was, again, still well below the federal limits. It was like 2008 time frame and it was still below the federal limits by, you know, less than like five or six percent of the federal limit. Well, and I, those I'll get were you. The, the limits that I believe the doctor or the uh, one of the speakers was referring to went back to the Manhattan Project. So there weren't necessarily limits based upon what we know from medical health today. I think um, my suggestion would be 
because we do have that data and that is important to the discussion whatever is decided I, I think we should that might be something we want to post on the website um, for this group just so people have access to that data that's right. a good point and the other thing I will add to that is Michelle's comment about the water that leaked out and went through the plume that data exists also and it put that in at a complement the stuff that went out from unit one the stuff that leaked out from units one and two so we'll get both that right. data can I, can I just okay. follow up on that I mean so it seems to me that there were four sources of tritium right there was the there was the the Indian point one leaking spent fuel pool which leaked both tritium along with strontium cobalt and other heavy isotopes and those made their way to the river and are still making their way to the river right then there was the actual treated Indian point one uh, tritium discharge and now we're talking about and then there was the operating reactors tritium discharge and I think what we know is I mean obviously that taken together that's a few sources um, I think we know that the environmental monitoring program didn't alarm during that period right that's right um, and I guess I would just say my concern here is that we're we're focused on tritium but I'm actually more worried about those heavy isotopes that are coming through the groundwater because those ones do bioaccumulate and they they mimic um, they mimic micronutrients in the body and are deposited in, in, in <coughs> bones and so <coughs> forth so so you know although tritium is an important issue I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact there are other issues and there are other sources uh, thank you for that and to the senator's question about what monitoring data exists we'll get that posted on the website Dave you can help us consolidate that um, and to your point Richard I you know I think even though those releases are through the groundwater um, there is at least some data on monitoring of yep. organisms as well right. and so that would also be informative data that we should collect and provide through the yeah. website and I know um, Assemblywoman Levenberg has another question but I think Dr. Falvo may have raised her hand and wanted to chime in on this discussion Dr. Falvo yeah um, what I really need to emphasize everybody talks about meeting or being below regulatory limits but that, that those are based not on the vulnerable populations at all. Yes. Um, and so while we feel very nice that we're below regulatory limits, as a pediatrician, I'm really unhappy because my kids and their mothers and the forming kids are not probably not at all protected by these levels. And we don't know because nobody's willing to study it uh, for a whole lot of reasons, some okay and some not. So I think when we, we should not be too complacent about meeting regulatory limits. They're, they're a minimum standard at best. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Dr. Falvo. Dave had a response. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Falvo. One of my other non-paying jobs is I'm on the board of advisors for the Gender and Radiation Impacts Project, which is looking at disparate effects on human life for the same exposures to radiation. The data shows that for the same exposure to a man, a woman has, suffers like two to four times as much health consequences, and a young girl is almost like ten times greater health consequences, yeah. which suggests strongly that the limits, as many pe speakers have said, are set up on a reference man, which for many years was me. but is 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 not protecting it's not the bounding individual so grips effort is to try to do the science change the regulations so that all people are protected equally not everybody subjected to the same limit that doesn't protect thank you everybody assemblywoman and i guess to that point uh and i appreciate uh, all the input that we've had from the various speakers um you no know, i think that this group is looking to make sure not that we meet standards, but that we actually protect health and human life here in this area for those people who live here. So uh, for us to be able to figure that out, um, I don't know how it's not that easy, but um, to the point of, you know, if we have information going back for many years from Indian Point when it was operational and when um, IP1 shut down, can we look at what the impacts are of bioaccumulation? Can we look at... Um, again, I can't remember if it was 
Dr. Salvo or um, Ms. Lee who mentioned that you know those low levels um, of uh, tritium might be worse than the higher levels, and maybe that's not what's so that's not necessarily what's important. Not even mentioning the point that you just made, um, Dave, about you know some of the impacts that, that are on on different people. But the other question that I had about as we're sort of moving forward to figure out what to do with the water. Um, and if one of the options is sort of, you know, well, wait and see, leave it in the tanks, how many tanks would it take? Would the water in those tanks that, that it waited in be treated? And um, I think, was that my one? Would it be treated? How many tanks would it take to hold that water on site? And can you just remind us again how likely it would be for until leaks were to be likely like yeah how likely would it be till we start seeing leaks some uh, past experiences that the leak occurred the first time you filled the tank because they lost track of the level indication and they just overfilled the tank so it leaked the very first time it was filled because the level indication gave them a false reading and that happened more than once you think it's it shouldn't happen more than once but lightning may only strike once stupidity strikes like a jackhammer sometimes it, <laughs> Um, but others have taken longer than that. Um, but it, like I said, sometimes the very first time you fill a tank, it's they overflow it. Dave, did you look at based on the million some odd gallons, uh, how how many tanks that would take? I did not, because okay. uh, it depends on the size of the tank. <laughs> right, you get one would the very water big. Be tank. treated if it were yes. to be hanging out in tanks. I'm sorry, say if, it again. If the water were to be waiting in tanks until some better solution were to come up, to arrive, would that water that's in those tanks be treated? Most likely, yes. And there w Richard, Kathy, and I had a discussion earlier this afternoon, and I have some more homework to go back. to. Look. There are ways to remove tritium from water. They're very expensive, but there may be ways for have DOE pay for that. And so If I've you got remove it, where does it go? You're not going to like this. But it's used to make nuclear weapons have even bigger bangs. Mm -hmm. So you wipe out entire communities, not just the block. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why they call it the H bomb, by the way. I believe Michelle Lee uh, may have had her hand up for that part of the discussion. Michelle, did you want to say something? Hi, Michelle. I think you just need to unmute. Yes, we can. Okay, I, I just want to emphasize again that the regulations are not validated by actual studies. And that is what the National of Academies of Science, I said, in its study last year. So we can talk from today until, you know, 2090 about like, what, you know, regulations and what this you know, was released at what date, but A, it's only reported what, what the operator reported. We know that the NRC did not regulate much of, uh, did not require reporting of, of underground leaks or leaks from systems that didn't rise to a certain level that was identified by the operator. You, you have a whole area of a pollution that is effectively has not been regulated and, and, and the level of regulation that exists is based on science that's 50 years old. You know, the, the, the emissions in are also, again, cumulative. It's all of the tritium, all of the other radionuclides, all of the other pollutants in, in the area, including the, the, that big incinerator. And those are things collectively are what are going to harm human beings and what are going to harm the, the, the ecosystem of the river, which is already a, a, a super fun site. So I really <coughs> am a, a, perplexed to understand this discussion because it's weighing public interest, which is clearly you don't don't release more toxins into this environmental justice community, into this already damaged, contaminated river, against what Holtec's, you know, desired profit is out of the 2.3 billion it took from New York. It, Holtec did not put one cent 
of its own money when it when it took over this site for decommissioning. And and from a cost benefit analysis, you're putting all of the cost on the public and all of the benefit on Holtec. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Dr. Becker had a comment, and then John Sipos, I believe. Dr. Becker? I hope so. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Uh, I'm the supervisor of the town, but I'm also a doctor, and I also trained at New York Medical College. Uh, and, you know, you can get snowed a lot by numbers, and there, the bottom line is there is no safe level of nuclear radiation. Uh, guidelines are established, as was said earlier, based on people's best guesstimate. The problem with radiation exposure is that you get it from multiple venues. So you may get it from the river in small amounts, but you have a problem, you're going to go for an x-ray, you're going to get some radiation there. You're going to get on a jet plane and take a trip, and you're going to get radiation there. And all those radiation doses are cumulative cumulative in the individual, cumulative in their genetics that will go generations. It hit, we do not know the effects of dumping this in the river, both short term and long term, and we won't know until we make a mistake. This stuff does not belong in the river. You presented four options. I guarantee there are more. There may not be now, tonight, but there will be in the future. And it, the environmental impact to this local community is just too extreme. And it's on top of, as uh, was mentioned earlier, this toxicities from other plants in this community. We already know that there's strontium in the, in the ground. That was reported years ago. So I think that when you start to say this is a safe level, you, know, you can look at the water. I spent a lot of my time on town water. Uh, and you'll read about the safe levels of lead but the safest level is zero. And so all water supplies try to get it as close to zero. We need the water. We have to get it to you by pipes. So there's going to be some lead in it, but we try to minimize it. And adding toxic chemicals without knowing the level, even if it appears dilute, some of it will filter down into the muck. Some will live in the fish that we eat. Some will end up in the uh, ocean. There's got to be a better alternative. So at least the, I think the position of the town of Cortland would be not to dump it in the river and to wait until there's a better solution. Thank you. John, did you have something? Or? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dave, you mentioned that you're also working with another group um, looking at standards. I'm wondering if um, you could share a little bit more about that and I also would like it if you could just confirm my understanding that these standards that this 20,000 um, Pico Curie uh, standard that we've been talking about that that is a federal government standard yes uh, that to answer that question it is as far as the work I've been doing for grip um, I researched the reference man, which started out as a standard man and then morphed into the reference man. And one of the things I, I still owe GRIP some more work on is in, in the early 80s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission revised the regulations for occupational exposure, workers. They were the same for men and women. In the early 80s, the NRC changed it so that women who were pregnant, wanting to become pregnant, would have a lower limit if they, if they announced their pregnancy. I wanted to understand why that happened, because if you live outside the fence and don't work for the company, it's the same limit for men, women, pregnant women, whatever. So I wanted to understand what, what the science was that allowed that change to protect nuclear female workers, but not community members who are female. So I want to understand that, that there may be some leverage there. You know, what was the science, that, how that happened? So that's some work I need to do for GRIP that may have some relevance here as well. And when you say GRIP is looking at this issue, has GRIP reached out to the federal regulatory bodies that have set this standard? Uh, GRIP, GRIP is smarter than that. <laughs> GRIP went worldwide. <laughs> GRIP is working with the United Nations. Uh, Mary Olson, the executive director, has made several presentations to the UN commissions that are looking at this, who agree, and it's a lot of their research that shows that young girls and females are more 
have more consequences from the same exposure. So it's, they're not, they're not wasting much time. That's my work is to try to figure out how the, 80, the early 80s change made in this country to f take what they're doing worldwide and make some changes here in the United States. Well, I ask that because um, the standards that we are dealing with right now are the federal standards. They're standards that have been promulgated by the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Federal United States Environmental <coughs> Protection Agency. Um, we do have various federal representatives uh, attending here tonight in person um, and online as well. Um, and so I understand they've gone to the international uh, communities, but um, I guess is there also an effort, um, are they considering an effort of approaching uh, the federal regulatory bodies, the federal elected uh, representatives um, to address this question? Um, I know it's an issue that's been out there for a while. I know Senator, then Senator Barack Obama raised this in 2008, um, but we have this standard here um, right now with the 20,000 limit. So um, what are, what is the, what is the play or the request or the ask to the federal regulatory bodies that have set and have implemented this standard? Well, GRIP is pursuing parallel paths. Worldwide, they're working with the United Nations and others to figure out what the science is so you can show, demonstrate why young girls and females have more cons So they need to understand why that's happening. On the other path, we're trying to figure out how has change occurred in the past here in the United States so we can see if any of those lessons are transferable to conditions today. So once we have the science nailed down, we then figure out what the pathway is to make which federal bodies need what information to make those changes. So those are the two paths that GRIP is pursuing to get to that outcome. Maybe I can just point out that having different standards for men and women is not that unusual. And in fact, in the Hudson, the fish advisory uh, does set different standards for, you know, old men can, can eat more fish than young women um, because of the reproductive effect. So it's, it's not uncommon to see that. Mayor Knickerbocker, I think you had a comment. Yes, I do. Um, Dave, I want to thank you for giving us the four options. I wasn't aware of all the options. Um, the discharge in the river. Um, as you spoke about, has been happening for 60, approximately 60 years since the plants have been there. Um, one thing I'm, I'm not for is the evaporation into the air, because you're saying also if it evaporates in the air, it also comes down, contaminates the ground. Uh, the other option to Idaho, that's very unfair. That's very unfair to another community. We would not want to take that here from another plant. The one thing I'm going to tell you, as the mayor of the host community that has been dealing with this, um, I have been involved since the announcement of the closure of 2017. Supervisor Puglisi started the Community Unity, which was an informational, which was great. It really, you know, because Who's done decommissioning before? None of us, you know. So it was a great educational segue for us. Then uh, it went to the Citizens Advisory Panel. Linda and I were also on that. So all advisory, all informational, we've all learned quite a bit. Now, thank you, Tom, um, and the state with the DOB. Um, it, was, it was better for the state to take over that because they had the monies to bring in experts and if experts had to be paid, you know, so, and it was, you know, informational and an advisory panel also. The one thing I will tell you, okay, s hearing about those tanks, hearing about the potential of it leaking, that's, that's a no-go for the village of Buchanan. I'm telling you right now, it's not happening. You'll hear me screaming from, from the rafters. It is not happening. We would like to use, so everybody knows, eventually that property will be decommissioned. 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, I don't know. We'll see when it gets decommissioned. But in the end, that property will be reused if possible. So if you're telling me that these tanks leak, now the tritium is all over the ground, so what's the point? So we have more contamination? So actually, I don't think the storage of that on the property is happening. I mean, it was an option. Thank you, Dave. Um, one of the things um, 
I had said from the beginning, it's all about the safe decommissioning and the safe restoration of the property. That's the mantra, that's the goal. I live in that community. I lived in that community my whole life. My mother was born there. She lived there for 93 years. I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but I've been there too, you know? What I'd like to see, because we're talking about health effects, there, are, there is data, there is medical data that goes back maybe in a 10 year period, how, many, how, many, how much of the population there was from the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, each 10 year, and what is the percentage of the certain illnesses? I'm sure that's, that's available. I would, be, I would be very interested in that. But uh, yeah, yeah, because we're talking about illness and, and different things, and I, I, in the village of Buchanan, uh, our neighbors in Verplank, our neighbors in Montrose, I'm not really uh, compared to the, you know, the, the amount of population, I'm not seeing a high incidence of cancer. So, and I think that's one of the things with, with uh, radiation that, that uh, triggers cancer. So I think, you know, just for the general knowledge, we hear all these things being thrown out. I think that would be interesting for us to kind of have an understanding of that. Just a, Thank a, you, quick, Mayor. a quick yeah, point. Sure. Two, th two points, one, in addition to water leaking from the tanks, all the tanks are vented, so some of it will evaporate. So tritium's gonna get on the ground, whether it leaks out or evaporates out. As far as the cancer studies, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was be launched a study into cancer effects, looking at are there cancer effects around nu nuclear power plants. They discontinued that study because it cost too much, $8 million. And it would have been spread out over an eight-year period, a million dollars a year, which is less than it costs for their annual conference with the industry. Well, there you go. But they canceled it because they too expensive to know the answers. That would Can have I just ask a clarifying question about tanks? Because normally, yeah, but we've we've got to sort of get back on the agenda. Right. But go ahead. Last, last question, last thing, and then yeah. Okay. Which is normally, in my experience, you know, when you have contaminated, you know, oils and stuff, you, you have a secondary containment. So if you have a tank failure then you still, you still don't leak the stuff into the environment. So I'm assuming that would be in place here, right? It's not required. Oh, well, it could be required. <laughs> I've got a better chance of but winning the lottery. Be, should, it, should it be required, Mr. Lockdown? I've got a better chance of winning a lottery, and I don't even buy lottery tickets. <laughs> should it be required? No, because it shouldn't be done. <laughs> Look, I, I'd like to try to wrap up this portion of the yeah. agenda because there's still another slide left uh, or two um, on the regulatory uh, framework on the spent fuel and and John Sipos you may want to you may want to um, start and then and hand it off to Kelly I think that there was a, a brief mention in Dave's slides about the Indian Point closure agreement and and a mention of the expectation there and then we can hand it off to Kelly as a segue Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I have known Dave uh, probably for uh, 16 or 17 years, was one of the first experts I brought on in the, uh, it, during the power plant litigation. So we go back a long way and we have a lot of respect for each other, I think. Um, I will say, you know, a couple of comments um, regarding exactly what uh, was anticipated in the 2017 agreement and the 2021 joint proposal. I think, you know, speaking as the lawyer for, for uh, DPS, I, I might have a different view as to um, some of the conclusions that Dave reached, and I think I'll just leave it at that, um, just so the record is clear on that, um, and now turn it over to, uh, to Kelly. Thanks, John. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about New York's regulatory framework. Um, in terms of wastewater discharges <clears throat> to waters of the state. Um, but I want to take a step back, back first um, and start with the Clean Water Act. Um, the Clean Water Act establishes a basic structure for regulating discharges of pollutants into the waters of the United States. This law is implemented by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And through this law, the EPA is able to delegate authority to states to run programs. So that's what EPA has done in New York. EPA has delegated the, the responsibilities of the Clean Water Act 
So issuance and enforcement of, of permits for discharges to the waters of the state to New York State. It is a program that New York developed. We call it the Speedies pro Program, and it has been approved by EPA. So specifically for Indian Point, New York State regulates wastewater discharges from Indian Point through a speedies permit. The speedies permit governs non-radiological discharges from the facility. And as I've spoken about in the past, um, the current status of the Holtec speedies permit for the Indian Point facility is that it is undergoing renewal before the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So their prior permit, because they applied to us on time for a renewal, still exists while we go through the process of renewing the permit. New York State DEC has determined that we will be undertaking a full technical review of their speedies permit. What this really means is we've asked Holtec to submit comprehensive data to identify and characterize the non-radiological waste stream from the facility. We will be reviewing that information and determining, determining what the appropriate effluent parameters and limits will be. Once the application has been deemed complete, once the, the Speedy's permit application has been deemed complete, we will draft a permit and put that out to public notice and accept public comment on that permit. So, as, as we continue these meetings, I will continue to keep everybody updated on the status of, of that permit procedure. And then just to follow up on, on what John has meant, had mentioned, um, radiological discharges from the facility are under the auspices of the federal government. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Kelly. And I wanna just thank all of the speakers, um, Michelle Lee, Dr. Falvo, Dave Lockbaum, Kelly. Um, this was a really very informative discussion and I'm sure uh, the beginning of further discussions on the topic, so thank you. Um, at this time, uh, I'd like to turn uh, to a public statement hearing portion of the meeting. We will, there are a lot of um, people who have pre-registered to speak. Um, there will be a three minute uh, timeline for each speaker. Um, we are going to take the speakers in the order in which they registered, starting with those who are here in person. Um, if we don't get to you during this 30-minute session, we will pick up the list at the end of the meeting for the last half hour. Um, and I want to remind everyone that um, there is still opportunity, and there always is opportunity, to submit questions in the Q&A on Zoom um, and, and statements that would be recorded there as well as comments on our website. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Kazmarek who will run through the list of pre-registered speakers. Tom? Thanks, Tom. Uh, we'll begin with individuals who are participating uh, in person today. Our first speaker will be Marilyn Ellie. Marilyn, if you want to start working your way up to the mic. Uh, followed by Nicholas Costellas and Christopher Vargo. Um, so just be prepared to come up after uh, Ms. Ellie has spoken. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Tom. And um, thank you to the board and to all of our speakers tonight. It certainly has been a very dense, information-packed meeting. And um, it's not just the facts. It's also hearing people be very clear with their opinions and <coughs> how they want to go forward. I think that's really important. It won't take me three minutes to say the point I want to make. Um, I've been following this issue for a long time, and um, I'm not interested in looking at any more facts, graphs, charts, or hard data. I've never seen that influence people or change anybody's mind. It just doesn't seem 
to work that way in my experience. What I am interested in is the morality of this issue, a medical issue, not a scientific <coughs> issue per se, but a medical issue that could do harm in the future. And for myself, I am perfectly willing to put aside both the scientific issue and the medical issue because dumping more pollution of any sort into the Hudson River is just wrong. It is not the thing to do. It is not the way we need to manage an historic river that belongs to all of us. It's happened for a long time. Too long. It's time for it to stop, period. And um, they have tanks of tritium in Fukushima. David mentioned that, and I had been thinking about that. Are they leaking? Yeah. Have they been there for a while? Yeah. Could we make them better? <laughs> Maybe they'll send us some of theirs and we can improve them. I do not know. But I, it's impossible to believe that it is not uh, reasonable to make a number of tanks that would hold a limited amount of water and could sit there until we have a better solution. The spent fuel rods are there. And as Senator Harkham has said in the Lattice Forum, they're going to be there in perpetuity. They're going to be there in perpetuity. So what's the harm, except for the money Holtec has to pay, in having a few more tanks of tritiated water, which is much less harmful to anybody? And I guess the last point that I want to make is that we really do need to start looking at what we're doing with an idea of doing what's best for the environment and what's best for future people. And putting, that, putting more poison of any kind in the river does not meet that kind of goal. So I'm really hoping that this body will move forward and figure out a way, maybe divide the property so that part of it can be developed and Ms. part Ms. of it, part of it's going to have to be there anyway because the spent fuel rods are there. I, I thank you. I, I apologize. We're we're beyond time. Uh, and I'm finished right okay. now. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. Mr. Costellas, are you with us tonight? Um. All right, Mr. Costellis, if you come back with us, uh, we'll fit you in. Uh, Christopher Vargo. Hi, Don. I'm Christopher Vargo. I live in Verplank, New York, right down the street from Indian Point. Uh, I'm going to repeat myself. I apologize. My name is Chris Vargo. I live at 26 Hardy Street in Verplank, New York. I've, I have enjoyed the Hudson River all my life. It gives me great joy to see my daughter and my son sharing the same love of the Hudson River. To say I'm concerned about the plan of, of Holtec to dump radioactive water into the Hudson River is an understatement. The Hudson River is used by millions of people for recreation, commerce each year. Additionally, hundreds of thousands of people depend on the Hudson River for the drinking water. Dumping radioactive water into the Hudson will substantially, will substantially affect the tourist and fishing industry, as well as all other activities people enjoy and depend on for their livelihoods. According to the Mid-Hudson Valley Community Profiles, the Mid-Hudson region contributed $2.2 billion to New York State in 2020, despite the COVID pandemic. Allowing Holtec to dump radioactive water in the Hudson River could destroy that industry for years. The reason Holtec is the reasoning that Holtec is following the government regulations doesn't make sense. First, if Holtec fails to strictly follow the guidelines or deviates from all of them, then it's too late. There's no way to retrieve radioactive water after it is released. Second, the government guidelines are only following for safe drinking water standards, and no one knows for certain the bioaccumulation effects on all marine life in the food chain. Remember, the Hudson River is a hatchery, a nursery, and a home for billions of marine life, birds and mammals. As a fisherman and a boater, I have to follow laws to protect the Hudson River. Why shouldn't Holtec have to do the same? 
Also, the marine life in the Hudson River is vital for the fish stocks in the Atlantic Ocean. So it doesn't matter if you're fishing for stripers off, the, off a steamboat dock in Verplank or on a 50-foot Viking fishing boat in the canyons fishing for tuna. If the marine life collapses in the Hudson River, both anglers are screwed. There are, there are no good solutions for disposing of radioactive water. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Environmental Protection Agency has to do better as there are many more nuclear power plants that are either being decommissioned or will be or will be decommissioned in the near future. Vermont Yankee was recently decommissioned and all the radioactive water was solidified and buried in an unpopulated area. And no, and, and was not allowed to dump any radioactive water into the Connecticut River, was permitted. Please don't put Holtex profits over the people and the wildlife in the Hudson Valley. There's no reason to allow Holtex to dump radioactive water into the Hudson River. I, I got a couple questions for David. I uh, about 20 seconds. Okay. Um, all right, real quick. I was told that it's really hard to detect radioactivity in water. And also, you left out that they solidify the radioactive water before they buried it. That's it. just two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Paul Blanche, and then followed by Tina Volz-Bongar and Jerry Silverman. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Paul Blanche. I reside in West Hartford, Connecticut. I've worked with John more than Dave. In fact, I think I introduced John and Dave to one another. So we go back a long time. I was one of John's experts. I violently agree with what Dave said, what Michelle said, and what Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Falvo said is we've got a problem. What was not mentioned here is concentration. What is the concentration of the water and the total activity to be discharged. We haven't got that number. We've done a brief calculation uh, based on some actual facts of about 28 curies of uh, tritium in the spent fuel pools. Uh, that is not much when you compare it to the radiation contained in an exit sign that I can buy at Walmart, which is 25 curies. Not a significant amount. There is a fifth option that we have, and this will also allow Holtec to comply with the regulatory requirements to have a spent fuel pool. It's in their FSAR. We have two spent fuel pools, and I believe each one of them is capable of storing about a million gallons. Now, we could comply with the regulation as stated in 10 CFR 72.122L to have the ability to retrieve damaged canisters by maintaining those spent fuel pools and storing the water until it decays, uh, tritium decays sufficiently and we can remove those other isotopes such as cesium, strontium, maybe some cobalt. I urge you to consider in light of a regulatory commitment by Holtec to retain the water in the spent fuel pools that by now are not leaking. We don't have to fill them up. We, don't, we already have gauges on the level. So I thank you for your time. And again, I want to compliment Tom because I've worked with other decommissioning boards. And this is the most well-organized board that I have dealt with, and I've dealt with a lot of them, and I want to thank everyone on the board, and I want to thank Dave for coming up here. Dave and I have been friends for almost 30 years, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tina? Yeah. And then after that will be Jerry Silverman and Judy uh, Dronzak. Hi, I'd like to reserve my comment until uh, Enbridge makes their presentation about the sinkhole in Yorktown. Is that still on the agenda? It is still on the agenda. Okay, I'd like to and comment after that. Can we bring can Tina we, up at the second, the, for the second portion, Tina? Thank for the second comment session? Okay. Thank you. Jerry Silverman? Uh, the next up would be uh, Judy uh, Dronzak. Are you with us tonight? 
Okay, again, Jerry and Judy, if, if you uh, present yourselves, we'll give you an opportunity. Uh, Jerry Rivers is next. Hmm? I promise these individuals registered. <laughs> Um, and if I'm butchering your names, please uh, forgive me. Uh, James Crichton. Following Mr. Crichton, uh, Greta N uh, Nettleton and Rachel Fenty. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm one of the council people here in the town of Cortland, so the, uh, one of the host communities here for Indian Point. Um, Look, releasing spent nuclear fuel pool water into the Hudson River has raised so many concerns among our community members. Um, the releases have been described as being dangerous and irresponsible actions that um, could have severe and long-lasting effects on the health of the river's ecosystem or Hudson Valley, Hudson Valley <laughs> communities um, that depend on it and our community, our people. Um, the radioactive materials contained in the water could pose a significant threat to our precious local waterfront and the wildlife, the fish, the people, um, all of whom rely on the Hudson River for boating, for fishing, for recreation, for drinking water, for recreation um, for our local businesses. Um, we therefore believe it's essential that alternative and safer methods for disposal are studied and pursued to protect the environmental and public health until we have a good answer, let's not do anything that's going to be something we'll, we'll regret later. Um, Town of Cortland is trying very hard to showcase our riverfront to, and to ensure that our residents um, can enjoy the beautiful piece of the Hudson Valley that we're stewards of. Um, in 1968, Pete Seeger, um, when he first stood on the deck of the, the Clearwater Sloop in its inaugural tour, said that it wasn't going to be the polluters or the politicians who would clean the Hudson River. He said, we want the people to come down to the river again, but the most important thing is to get together. All of us, young and old, black and white, rich and poor, long hair and crew cut, because we just won't make it unless we can talk to one another and agree on what we have to do. Let's make sure that we could be forward thinking together enough to avoid the short term solutions, the ones that make us money, and let's protect our Hudson River for generations to come. We can't dump or discharge harmful tainted water that will impact us for decades or more. Let's take the time to study properly and get this right. Let's do it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Greta Nettleton. And then it will be followed by Rachel Fenty and John Sullivan. Uh, hi, thank you so much for letting me speak. Um, I'm very new to this whole topic. And um, I live across the river in Rockland County. And I'm a boater. And I use the Hudson River um, as a rower. I walk uh, in my boat into the water up to the knees four or five times a week. And so I'm very aware, since I'm downstream, about what might be coming. And um, so I'm really, really thrilled that people are discussing this. And I can't tell you, it's not just your town. It's all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Fenty. Is John Sullivan with us tonight? Yes. Thank you. And that will be followed by Courtney Williams and Lolly Yacker. Hi. Thank you for the work you guys are doing. Um, first question is for Dave. Uh, how many years would it take storing the fuel, the tritium water? Uh, you often quote five uh, half-lives. Ten. Ten. So it's going to be 120 years that would need to be stored? Okay, if you to want get to, to zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for Kelly and for John, and I don't know whether you guys are in the position to answer this or want to answer this, um, my understanding is that the EPA has delegated uh, DEC to issue SPEDIS permits and that one of the um, that it is for radiological releases, all right, 
And one is, is the health and safety of the humans involved. But the other is that it is reasonable, the least, most reasonable level, least reasonable level. In other words, <coughs> I actually had it written out. So <laughs> <laughs> the idea being that not only do we have to worry about the specific effect on people, but that we're going to do it in the most cautious way possible. And so it's the least reasonable <coughs> level, okay? So there are two things for that speedy's permit. Uh, the question is this, why is the NRC, and I also read the uh, National, P, National Pol Public, National Nuclear Waste Act, which reserved it only for defense. It didn't reserve it for commercial reactors, all right? Um, and John, the, the issue is, did we give away this in the agreement, okay? So why is it that we don't have, why is Indian Point different? Why is it not under this? Why is the NRC saying this? Do they in fact have a basis in law? Are we willing to challenge that basis? And uh, why is Massachusetts different? Why do they think that they can stop them? And we are saying we can't. So, um, and. So I'll take a crack at that, uh, okay. at least to a couple of the questions. To the question, did the agreement give anything away? No, it did not. Okay. Um, and prompt decommissioning is in the public interest. Um, secondly, under, for, for, this, for this facility, the release of radionuclides is under the auspices of the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States Environmental Protection Agency. I think the, the citations were put up on the screen and that's the way it is, is set up. Um, that, that's the way it is set up here. In Massachusetts, uh, they have, it's a, it's a different permit framework and my understanding in, is that in that permit, it did not specifically reference spent fuel pool water so different framework different language that's why it's different so, so it's we would have to see what the actual legal language is to see the difference it's a different framework and that the permit that is at issue is being discussed in Massachusetts under the auspices of, of, of uh, the Environmental Protection Agency they are the ones who are communicating uh, with Holtec about what the permit in Massachusetts does and does not allow. That's the federal EPA? Yes. Okay, but we're delegated by the federal EPA to set standards. The DEC is here in New York. We have an authorized program. I want to use my words carefully. But for this facility, for, for, for this facility, it is the NRC and the EPA that set the standards. And that's where the 20,000 pico curies per liter comes from. That is the Federal Environmental Protection Agency maximum contaminant level also for drinking water. That okay. is a federal standard. And that is where I would respectfully suggest concerns be expressed. Okay. And thank you, John. Um, and and just um, for the sake order's sake, um, in the public statement hearing portion, we 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 do ask that it just be a public statement and not a Q and A. I wanted to allow that only because it felt like there was some confusion about the earlier presentation, and I thought it was worth allowing the clarification. So I appreciate your your comments, John, and okay. the questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. After Ms. Williams is Lolly Yacker, and then we'll move to our Zoom participants. Sure, thank you all. Courtney Williams from Peekskill. Um, it just, or another reminder, legal does not mean safe. And I say that as a cancer researcher, we know full well that the legal limits are not the same thing as the safe limits. And what is at stake here on one hand is our health and safety, the health of our river versus Holtex shareholders. I don't think that that's really much of a contest. 
Um, I would also like to say that the slides on the options for what to do with the water, I couldn't even take screen caps fast enough to get through those. Um, you know, if this part of this is going to be public awareness and including the public, we need more meetings. We need another meeting, and we need presentations that are actually accessible to a lay audience. And really, I am so happy to see so many folks here tonight, but this is not a representative cross-section of the people that live in this community. We're not doing a good enough job to make sure folks are aware. So I would suggest uh, meeting more frequently and having more meetings that the public can attend. And six o'clock is hard for a lot of people. I had to rush right here from work. Um, I would also like to say I'm really glad Dr. Becker spoke up um, on the health impacts. And I'm glad Dr. Um, Falvo was here, but she was here one time. We need a permanent person on this DOB that is versed in the science of radioactivity in terms of the medical and health impacts. We need, a, like, not an engineer. We need a doctor. We need a medical researcher that knows these things and can participate in every meeting to be that voice and ask those questions consistently, not come in once, be interrupted 40 times, nobody can hear them in the room, et cetera, et cetera. We deserve to have someone to speak up on behalf of our health at every single meeting. When it comes to the spent fuel pools, I have used tritium in my research routinely. Doesn't worry me nearly as much as what all else is in that water that we don't know about. Who tested it? What did they test for? How much can we trust that data? You know, think back. The Hudson's a Superfund site. GE had to flip the lever and dump all those PCBs. We conceivably are at that juncture where we're controlling whether or not to flip that switch. And we know full well that once it's done, it's not getting cleaned up. Governor Cuomo let GE off. You know, we can't eat fish from the river because of the PCBs. GE didn't restore that. We are at a precipice here. We can do the right thing. And frankly, tritiated water has been detected in Rockland County's water supply when they were studying reverse osmosis. So the cat's out of the bag. We Ms. can Williams, just make it worse. We're at time now. And how about putting a parent on the school monitoring group? Is Lolly Yacker in attendance? I have learned a lot this evening, and I'm so happy to see everybody here, and I appreciate the panel. Um, so we've heard about the susceptibilities on health, uh, the safety of individuals. Um, I mean, Hudson River is a historic site. It needs to be preserved. We need to have clean water. It has to be... Uh, I mean, we, you know, it, it affects from the f food chain in the water to, to uh, our standards of living. What I do feel, um, personally, because I've had teaching in the past, is that it's like Holtec is getting away with cheating on a test. And I don't know how we could, uh, you know, hold Holtec accountable or push Holtec past the standards. Um, I, I know a lot of the meetings, I'm, I, I'm not sure how much litigation could be done to make sure that there's zero emissions in the water. I, I, um, so, so those are the questions that I have, is how much can the decommissioning committee do? And if the results are going back to Holtec, that they don't, um, I, I don't know, mess with the, the uh, statistics or you know, change whatever it is that, that they get, the, the reports. So that's what I have to say, and I appreciate everybody's effort into continuing to work with Holtec on, on um, just trying to get rid of this, the radiation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to our Zoom participants who registered to speak. Uh, we'll only have uh, time for, for one or two uh, at this juncture, but as uh, Tom Congdon noted earlier, there will be additional time 
allotted at, uh, toward the end of the meeting. Uh, first, we have Marie and Sarah. Our staff are going to unmute you. You may uh, unmute yourself and begin when you're ready. Um, I am going to cede my time. I haven't been feeling well and I really am not prepared. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Jacqueline Dressler and that will be followed by Susanna Glidden. So Jacqueline. Hi. Hi there, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, it's great uh, to be here at this meeting tonight. I'm from Rockland County, and I'm um, speaking also on behalf of my sister, Jocelyn DiCrescenzo. First of all, water. Dilution is not the solution. It's crunch time for Holtec to pony up and use the money from the $2 billion decommissioning fund for safe decommissioning. Keyword, safe. Once again, according to the NRC, there is no safe limit of tritium to ingest. Long-term on-site storage of radioactive wastewater is a more expensive option which will lead into Holtec's intake of profits, but it is safer than dumping tritium-laden water into the Hudson River. Tritium settles in sediment and gets into the food chain. According to Dan Shapley of Riverkeeper, the Hudson River is an engine for life, not only of the river, but for the ocean ecosystem. The small fish from the Hudson are part of the food chain for the whales when season our waters on whale watching tours. Continuing the cleanup of the legacy toxins of PCBs and other toxins and dumping 1 million gallons of tritium-laden water into the Hudson is nuts. Children and the immune-compromised people are especially at risk, and so many people, over 106,000, who rely on the Hudson River water for their needs will be at risk. The International Atomic Energy Agency believes that radioactive waste needs to be in leak-proof containers and not in our waterways. <coughs> Regarding transportation, removing this waste and transporting it through local communities to faraway places such as New Mexico, Idaho, Texas, to disadvantaged and environmental justice communities already overburdened by toxic industrial and nuclear waste is an outrage. People will rise up against moving this hazardous waste by truck, barge, or rail. I recently heard Paul Blanche say that transportation and having routes and railroads to handle 200,000 pound canisters cannot be done for nuclear power plants. Regarding monitoring, the fact that children and teachers have been attending school without monitoring for air pollution, particulate matters, and radioactive waste matter is unconscionable. What have the children been breathing? They suck up everything like sponges, and as we already know and have heard from many doctors, including Dr. Helen Caldicott and the doctor who was on tonight, Dr. Falvo, children are, and, and Michelle Lee, Children are especially sensitive and much more affected, especially to the cellular level. This is not rocket science, it's medical science. Okay, regarding problems, there's not enough time to go into the exemptions. Exemptions for reporting of daily events, for not having to disclose what's in the water, for not having to do emergency planning, for not examining welds on cast, or for violations that this criminal company, Holtec, persistently is fined for violations for workers' health, security violations at Oyster Creek. Instead of the NRC working on redefining what is high or low level waste, the NRC should redefine and overhaul itself into the 21st century on the extremely serious and urgent matter of public health and current medical science. Ms. Drexler. Also, yes. Uh, you're at time. Okay. Thank you very much. I guess I can send in my comments to somewhere. Yes, absolutely. On our website is a feature to submit comments. Okay, thank you very much. Thank and you. I just did want to just say one thank you, especially to Tom Condon and Tom Kazmarek for all the help with me and for rearranging the content of this meeting to accommodate so many more newcomers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the kind words. Thank you. And uh, I believe we have time for one more at this juncture. Uh, Susanna Glidden. If you're on, uh, we'll un you're unmuted now, and you may begin when you're ready. Susanna, you may have to unmute on, on your end. Susanna, if, if you're speaking, we're not able to hear you. Okay. 
She's double muted. All right. It, you may be double muted, in which case your, your device may be muted as well. But uh, I think we've all had experience with that before. But if, if you're not on at the moment, we will afford an opportunity uh, when we pick this up again in uh, a little while later tonight. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, and, and, and I know there are other folks uh, on the Zoom. I'm sorry, is Susanna ready? Okay, yes, Susanna, I, I, I think you've unmuted. Go ahead. All right, thank you. So as we've said several times tonight, this is a public health and safety issue, this whole nuclear operation and decommissioning. Dave Lockbaum is a nuclear expert. We need a medical doctor familiar with radionuclides health impacts and an emergency preparedness expert appointed to the DOB and attending every meeting. And we'd like every member, please, of the DOB to also watch our public health and safety forums that members of the public are hosting and please create a section on the docket for these critical videos. As others have said tonight, Holtec must not discharge fuel pool water into the Hudson River. We've worked hard to clean up and protect, and that supplies seven upstream municipalities their drinking water. And Holtec cannot be allowed to refuse to reveal the makeup of pool wastewater. So we call for a sample of wastewater after the rods are out to be tested by an independent lab approved by the citizenry and not funded by industry to reveal both elements and the amounts of them. Only storing in tanks or kept in the pools is acceptable. The filtering system Holtec alleges it uses before storage must also be identified to understand how much is actually removed and who oversees it. Tritium, however, can't be filtered out. It remains a lethal poison if ingested. It's taken in by fish, eaten by people, or drunk by people upstream. Cumulative impacts from years of releasing pool water must now stop. No more poisoning us and the environment. Either store it on site to let the tritium decay for five, or as Dave just said, 10 half-lives, or best keep it in the pools to decay and also provide by keeping the pools open, the only method NRC allows a leaking canister to be reloaded in the pool water. I think Paul Blanche just said that. Only recently an RFP, shockingly only recently, was sent out for bidding to install air monitors for radioactivity, most essentially at nearby schools. While deconstruction took place without tenting, without monitors, children were allowed to return to school last fall. Does refusing to air monitor thus far indicate Holtec and NRC's intention to let radioactivity be absorbed by the trees, the soil, <laughs> the water, and by people, including our school children? Holtec has applied for an exemption from emergency preparedness, claiming nothing will ever happen, but Holtec's loading system unavoidably scrapes carbon steel Su onto their stainless steel thin wall canisters. Susanna, carbon, uh, 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 un unfortunately, yes. you're at time. Well, those carbon particles create pit corrosion and cracking. So please keep the pools open for emergency reloading on site. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. And thank you, Tom, for conducting that <laughs> portion. Um, before we turn to the, the, the next topic, I just thought uh, a few points of clarification based on some of the things we just heard um, on, on the public statement portion of the meeting. Um, there, was, there was some insinuation, I think, that there will not be uh, a characterization of the water in the pool. Um, I don't believe that's the case. There will be a waste characterization uh, of the contaminants in the pool. Absolutely. And um, what, I, what I'd like to follow up with our resident inspector and our team on, and, and perhaps with the NRC, because I also heard, you know, who's, who's <laughs> testing, but who's verifying. And so as an oversight function, I think as a follow-up, we'll take back how we can best verify 
the characterization that will absolutely be required uh, working with the NRC and our own resident inspector and nuclear experts at the DPS. Um, there was another comment that was made pertaining to uh, the beginning of decommissioning without monitoring. Um, we started the meeting, importantly, with Dave uh, going back over some of the slides that the school monitoring working group had developed early on in the DOB um, proceeding, where we noted the existing network of radiological monitors that are in the community today, that have been in the community for quite some time, that are real-time 24-7 monitors, that are beyond the license requirements, um, will remain intact, are operational, and, and we continue to have data from those in real time. Um, so it, I wanted to clarify and be extra clear with the community that there has been and there will continue to be radiological monitors 24-7 in a ring around the plant um, with several located between the plant and the school that is, that is close by. Um, so I just didn't want that to be left um, uh, with, without clarifying. Um, so with that, I want to turn back to some DOB uh, presentations. Um, and uh, I know that many of you in the community uh, read some news in December related to um, a sinkhole in the Enbridge pipeline right-of-way, uh, eight miles from the plant in Yorktown. And I thought it would be of uh, strong interest in the community to have Enbridge join us via Zoom and provide um, a summary of what occurred and what they are doing uh, to uh, investigate the matter further. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Sheridan from Enbridge. John? John, you'll have to unmute. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John Sheridan, uh, Government Relations uh, uh, for uh, Enbridge and Algonquin. Uh, just to uh, provide a, uh, an update on uh, the, uh, the issue of the sinkhole. Um, so on December 24th, uh, we were made aware of a sinkhole near the Algonquin uh, pipeline system in Yorktown, uh, New York. Uh, following our prompt response, we determined that our pipeline system remained in safe operating condition. And we worked closely with local officials and first responders to restrict access to the immediate area and support ongoing public safety. We also monitored the area around the clock to evaluate the condition of the sinkhole area in our pipeline facilities. Work crews were able to make a safe excavation and inspect the, ex the exposed 42 inch pipeline. A small holiday in the pipeline coating was found. So as part of our uh, maintenance program, we brushed the coating down to clean steel and recoated that section of pipe. The issue was resolved. There was no damage to the pipeline. I also believe DPS uh, acting as uh, an agent of PHMSA was on site when the work was completed. Uh, in addition, we implemented a plan to safely fill the sinkhole with appropriate materials Excuse me. I, I was cut off there for a second. Um, and so, um, and uh, added topsoil and mulch and stabilized the site for the winter. Uh, around the clock security and fencing remain around the area. The park remains closed while we complete a thorough review to further assess the geophysical characteristics at this location. Uh, safety of the public and the environment is, is our top priority. And our highly trained team will continue to work with local officials. I'd also like to add, Mr. Chairman, that when the final review and assessment is complete, we'd be willing to uh, come back and provide an update at the next quarterly meeting. That's really all I have at this time, Mr. Chairman, to share. Uh, this evening, uh, and I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Senator Harkum. Come. Hi, John. This is Pete Harkum, New York State Senate. Um, I guess it was about 10 days, two weeks after the sinkhole incident, one of your local attorneys who represents you in matters called me, gave me essentially what, what you just said, and said, 
um, in the very near future there would be a briefing for elected officials. That briefing has never occurred. Um, so, you know, you know this community is sensitive to the existence of the pipeline. People are clamoring for information and there is really no communication from Enbridge to the public at large or the elected officials who could provide that information. And, you know, this is just the kind of thing that doesn't breed confidence in the community about Enbridge being a good neighbor. Thank you, Senator. Uh, John, do you want to respond? Yes, uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, and we, we, try, we, we, we want to get the full assessment done so that we can provide um, up-to-date and accurate information. So I apologize for the, for the delay. Uh, but we will be circling back with you and other officials uh, in, in the not too distant future to provide that update and to make sure that those communications, those lines of communications uh, remain open. So I apologize if, uh, if we haven't gotten back to you uh, as quickly as, uh, as, as you would have liked, but we certainly will uh, close the loop on that, sir. John, um, could you please just clarify exactly what a holiday is? So, you know, for the people not versed in, in, in gas pipeline safety, understand what, what, what that was when you mentioned a, a, a holiday in the coating? Sure. Uh, a holiday in industry terms refers to damage to the coating, uh, similar to uh, a scratch you get on your hand. Uh, and in this case, it was, a, it was an abrasion. It was a scratch on the pipeline. And... Uh, you know, part of our, uh, our guidelines, our operating guidelines, uh, whenever we expose a pipe, we're required to do a pipe and coating report, and that's when we discovered a holiday. And so, again, we went out there and we, um, we brushed the coating down to clean steel, and then we coated the section of pipe. It, it's, it's not unusual that we have to do this uh, along the pipeline system from time to time. Thank you, John. If we could turn to Suresh Thomas from the Department of Public Service for uh, an update also on, on the pipeline issues. So Suresh, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Hi. Suresh. Thank you. Uh, subsequent to um, the December 22nd sinkhole even notification, uh, our staff engineers were on site uh, uh, immediately after we were alerted. Staff confirmed site was secured. We observed the testing of the pipeline um, after it was safe to uh, do the work over there. We did not find any condition warranting or, or altered operation of the pipeline. Staff continues discussions with the operator as investigation continues. That's all I have on this. Um, on the incident, thank you. If you could, on the next slide. Oh, one more. One more. Go ahead, Suresh. Suresh, are you still with us? Or is it Kevin Spicer from DPS with us? Yes, I am here. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, regarding the um, Enbridge exercise, Enbridge currently working with the Haltech, DPS, and state and local emergency responders to schedule emergency preparedness tabletop exercise. And um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory study on December 16, 2022, FIMSA released updated assessment conducted by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. FIMSA presentation outlines key findings. Both are available at dps.ny.gov slash Indian point. FIMSA is accepting questions from public and you can submit at FIMSA public affairs at doh.gov, that link. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Suresh, very much. Richard, I think you had a comment. Yeah, this is for Enbridge. Is, did this sinkhole occur in an area where you predicted that sinkholes were a possibility? John, are you still with us? Did you get the question, John? 
I did not get the question. Okay. The question the question was um, did did the sinkhole occur in an area of the right of way where Enbridge was aware that sinkholes could be a possibility? I, I don't have that information this evening. Um, I, I can't respond to that. I, I would have to circle back to you. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Right. Another question. Could a similar sinkhole occur anywhere else in the right of way? We have other questions. Yeah. Do, uh, I, I, the other question is, could another sinkhole occur elsewhere in the right-of-way? Yeah. Well, currently we're doing a, a full assessment uh, of, of what occurred, and uh, hard, hard to speculate until we have all the facts in front of us before we can... Well, know, let me just comment that you had the fact. Hopefully you should have had the facts before you put the pipeline there. Other folks have questions. Yeah. Assemblywoman Levenberg. Uh, it's kind of a similar, along similar lines, I guess, um, what, and also uh, my colleague on the left. Um, w one of the issues that there has been all along with Enbridge is, you know, not knowing from a distance where these, where the pipelines are being monitored from Texas that, you know, what is actually happening on the ground. And this is just another example, whether it's a leak or a sinkhole, uh, there's no, uh, local oversight and you know it's not clear also even from the FIMSA report um, I, I think there's no, uh, just another question for, for that report is I think it that um, when they released it they said it was actually um, completed in August but it wasn't made available to any of us until December unless it was and I just wasn't um, aware of it um, and you know it's not clear what the delay was in getting that information <coughs> Um, why that took so long. But again, it gets, it's still back to the point of this delay in information that could be pertinent to public safety, which in this case, it is. Thank you. I would encourage you to submit that question about the timing to the email for questions, because they are being responsive, um, FMSA, to the questions that are being posed. Okay, anything else on pipeline? Okay. Okay, so um, moving through to the next item on the agenda. Rich Baroni is here. Um, he's going to go through. Okay, Rich. Um, the Rich Baroni fan club is here. Wow. Hey, good evening. I'm Rich Baroni. I'm the site vice president at Indian Point. Uh, next slide, just go through the agenda. Uh, really what I want to do is um, just talk about our completed activities uh, since the last DOB, which is December 7th, <coughs> and where we project we will be uh, by the next DOB, which is April 27th of this year. Um, what I'll talk to is the dry fuel project, which consists of the asphyxi pad, uh, the unit two spent fuel defuel status, the unit three spent fuel pool building, and, and the new high lift crane that we are installing. Uh, then I'll go into vessel segmentation at both units. And we'll talk about some of the building uh, demolition activities that are in oh, progress. Excuse me, Rich. If you could please bring the mic closer. How about that? Thank you. We can hear you, but for the transcript, it's important. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll go through some building demolition activities. Um, I know you're, uh, the crowd's uh, interested in the NRC inspection and their activities. Uh, we did get a uh, NRC severity level four uh, violation I'll talk about in detail. And then uh, we'll talk about some of our industrial safety trend and our corrective actions. So the dry fuel project really uh, con conclu concludes with all fuel from both spent fuel pools transferred to the independent spent fuel storage installation known as the ASFISI. All right, the protected area fence, nuisance fence, and a vehicle barrier system are required to be installed. Uh, the dry fuel project is projected to be complete prior to the end of the fourth quarter of uh, this year, 2023. Uh, regarding the uh, asphyxi pad, as previously noted, an additional pad had to be constructed to accommodate all of the uh, Holtec High Storm 100S casks. 127 casks are needed to secure all the fuel from both Unit 2 and Unit 3 spent fuel pools. Uh, the original pad will hold 75 casks, and the new pad will hold 52. And as reported in the previous DOB, 
uh, fencing and monitoring equipment have already been installed such that both pads are now part of our protected area on site. Uh, since the last oversight board meeting, uh, the vehicle barrier system installation at B Phase 4 is being bid by uh, independent contractors. Uh, we expect those bids to be submitted shortly. Uh, this system is for a standalone barrier system for the two pads. And then we did start removal of the condensate storage tank, and I'll show you a picture next slide. Uh, projected activities through April uh, will have the CST removed and we'll award the bid to install the vehicle barrier system and start construction activities. Next slide. So this shows the new pad with some of our um, casks already on there from Unit 2. The tank that you see there approximately, I guess, at the 3 o'clock position, uh, that's the condensate storage tank that's in the process of being removed right now. Next slide. So proceeding to the Unit 2 spent fuel pool defuel status. Uh, recap, 896 fuel assemblies needed to be cast at Unit 2. That required 28 casks. Um, since the last oversight board meeting, a Unit 2 spent fuel pool offload is complete. All 28 casks are currently located uh, between the two asphyxi pads. This was one of our first major milestones that we did. Um, we completed that approximately three weeks early. So compliments to the, deep, the dry fuel team. They did a great job there. Uh, projected activities through April 27th include uh, there's some necessary equipment we'll transfer from Unit uh, 2's FSB to Unit 3's FSB, and they'll be required for fuel removal. And then basically we're planning for fuel rack removal uh, over the next two to three months. All right, that means we'll develop work orders to do that. We'll perform preventive maintenance on equipment needed uh, to remove the racks. We'll have to, we need to fabricate a rack lifting device that's being done in our on our Camden facility. And then we'll order our rack containers for disposal of the racks, and those will go to WCS in Texas. Next slide. Unit three, uh, we're working on the, uh, modifying the, the building itself and installing the, the new high lift crane. So we completed modifications to the FSB uh, to prov the building, I'm sorry, to support the high lift. Uh, we completed a factory acceptance testing of the crane itself in um, a facility in Pittsburgh. Uh, we shipped and assembled the vertical cast transporter for the Unit 3 high track slash high storm casks. These casks are a little bit uh, different uh, dimension, so they require a, a different vertical cast transporter. And we commenced building the high lift. Uh, projected activities through April 27th include a complete assembling the high lift crane, We'll perform site acceptance testing. We'll finalize procedure development and the operation of the high lift. And our first fuel moves currently scheduled for the beginning of May. So 41 casks will be required for all of the fuel in Unit 3 spent fuel pool. Next slide. This basically shows the modifications we had to do to the building. Um, we had to uh, modify ductwork for our heating and ventilation system. We had to modify our walkway to facilitate installation of the high lift itself. Uh, the suction piping to the uh, cooling system had to be moved again, just based on the um, uh, configuration of the high lift crane itself. We put a new floor and rail system in to transport casks out of the building, and we created openings for uh, high lift access. Next slide. So this is the construction of the new crane. All right, they're called outriggers and swing arms. Um, so basically, um, we go west, we go west, furthest west to east, right? And so we're proceeding with the installation of the high lift itself. Uh, next slide. And it shows just the further um, where we are with the high lift crane itself. Um, that's all I have for now for a dry fuel project. So are there any questions on fuel? Dave. Do you use the same, roughly the same team for Unit 3 as you did on Unit 2? Or no, they're independent teams for the high lift versus the, the team that uh, removed the fuel from Unit 2. They'll now transfer those guys over to Unit 3. So they'll have that experience and just carry that, it forward? Absolutely. Thank you. Not only that, right, some of the guys will remain at Unit 2 to remove the racks. Okay. Can, Rich, can I ask you a question that came up from the public comment, which is people are suggesting that you can move the 
if there's a problem with the cask, you can move it back to the f fuel pools. Will your system accommodate that? Could you repeat? I, I didn't I get it either. People are saying, yeah. obviously, tonight my accent seems to be stronger than you. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I, could, I, I grew up in a family full of accents, <laughs> Mr. Webster, but I just can't get it. <laughs> and it's me. I know it's right. me. Yeah. <laughs> so, I should have brought my translator, you know, that would have been good. But, um, so, some of members of the public were suggesting that a good reason to leave fuel behind, in a, or not fuel, but leave water behind in the spent fuel pool, is because if you had a problem with a canister in a cask, then you could transport it back to the fuel pool mm -hmm. to be re, uh, you know, re, re, recast or recanistered or whatever, right? I understand. Can your system accommodate that? Could you transport a cask back from the fuel from the from the ifs if the ifs for see pad ifs for see. <laughs> <laughs> back to the back we, to the back to the fuel pool. Can you, in other words, can it, is it reversible? Right, we can, but that's not our business model. What we would do is bring another. It's called a high star. We would transfer the cask into the high star and then do any analysis we had to do. And, well, maybe I don't want to get. And up maybe the just explain what the high star yeah. is. The high star would be another container that we would. The MPC within. The cask is what actually holds the fuel. Yeah. So if there's an issue with the MPC or the high storm, we would transfer it to a high star, and there we would do the analysis and see what uh, any corrections that were needed to the MPC itself. All right. There's not been any leakage with the any leakage at all with any of the uh, Holtec uh, MPCs themselves. Right. I think maybe we'll come back to that another time because I know it's a complicated topic. But thanks for that information. Right. You're welcome. Any other questions on fuel? Okay, go on. Well, I, well maybe I, I have the big question, right, which is, you've got unit two pool empty, so when do you want to lose the water? Right now, the tentatively scheduled to discharge water from the spent fuel pool uh, late August, early September. And would you be prepared to wait on that until the state gives you the okay? Who should be prepared when? I'm sorry. Would you pre be prepared to delay that discharge until the state gives you the okay? Right now, we would just operate with our existing procedures and the requirements that we have either from the state or from the NRC. Right. And I'm asking a question. I'm not asking what the existing okay, procedures are. transparency? No. Okay. I'm not going to I'm not going to be here and, and tell you a different story. Right, our schedule is again. Right, we want to meet this 12 to 15 year requirement, and, and I understand okay. the emotional part about discharge to the river. I get that, and in fact, I even have a recommendation that we could talk about later. Right, but right now our schedule calls for defueling or dewatering the unit two spent fuel pool uh, late August, early September. Okay, so can you give us an, an, an undertaking that you won't do it before then? <laughs> he asked from <laughs> Mr. Webster, would you give a commitment that you won't discharge before that time frame? Before August, September time frame that you just said. I, I won't commit to that. I mean, it all depends on how we proceed with the rack removal. There will be some cleanup that's required within the pool itself, right? Uh, the racks had uh, boroflex, which we believe did leave some sediment on the bottom of the pool. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to clean all of that. Mm -hmm. Right, we'll vacuum that up again, transport that um, okay. in accordance with rules and regulations. So I, I don't want to commit to August, September. We may be real efficient and be able to, to move that up. All right, let me, let me try one last thing, Rich. Go ahead. You know, I know we're going to get to yes at some point, but we just, have to, <laughs> we just have, to have to work at it, right? So can you give us a commitment that you'll give us a month's notice before you discharge from the river? Sure. Ah, there we go, you see? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Assemblymember Levenberg, please. Uh, it does DPS have any control over that or not? As I'll turn it over to my council. You said it before, but I just yeah. want to clarify. Oh, John. <clears throat> so the framework for releasing water from the pools is a United States federal. Environmental Protection Agency and Nuclear Regulatory 
framework. It is their auspices that controls that. But do we have any control over it? I, I mean, I heard what you said, but I, I, I think that the question is still relevant. Uh, you know, can we, can the state, in fact, if we have, you know, any evidence that, that we believe this is not the best way to proceed, whether or not the federal government has control, I mean, can we impact that, that timing at this point? I guess that's the question. Yeah, I think we'd have to explore it. I think that would be the most appropriate thing for me to say right now. But I, I really do want to come back to the issue of effluent, liquid effluent discharge is a federal, is under the auspices of two federal agencies. Um, and the place to advocate and to interact and communicate and suggest an initiative is with those two agencies and the federal elected representatives. County Legislator Colin Smith. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Tom, um, so I, I do have a question with respect to um, everything that we've not only heard here tonight about uh, you know what is is known with respect to the discharge into the into the Hudson River, um, the the very deep and grave concerns that the community has that local industry has with respect to that. Do I mean has has Holtec looked at that at all before this? I'm I'm, I'm not trying to be tongue in cheek here, but. I mean, have, have you had any conversations surrounding that, uh, you know, that issue, you know, in your decision regarding uh, if and when you're going to discharge? I, I understand that it's under the federal auspices, but I'm just asking as a, as a business consideration and as a, you know, considering the, the, the concerns in the community as well as in local uh, industry, local businesses, um, is, is it something that, uh, you know, Holtec is just, not at all uh, considered, or has there been any consideration taken up until this point? Well, in this case, Holtec is me, right? So I, I'll tell you this, you. that our releases per RLR program, which is as low as reasonably achievable, that's what LR stands for, requires us to discharge radio nuclides less than 1% of what the NRC, um, what the NRC limits are. So that's, that's number one. Number two, I did talk to my decommissioning director on the way here today. Almost what Courtney said, I, I, I think if we can have a discussion, not with a thousand people, because it's not going to work, right? But we have a radiological environment operating report that goes to the NRC on a yearly basis. It tells you every radionuclide that we d discharge to the, to the river, right, and its effects. Right? So we can go over that report. Monthly, we send a report to the DEC right? that, again, shows all of the discharge parameters. We'd be, I'd be more than willing to sit down with a, I think a smaller group would work best, right? just so everybody understands what the issue is, and then we could communicate it to everybody. I, I really think that that would, well, it won't, it won't appease everybody. I get that. But, but I, I think long term, at least people will understand where we are with this. I think right. I hear agreement between something Courtney Williams said and what you said, which is we need more. Yeah, it's amazing. We, we, we need more meetings. <laughs> so um, so we'll, we'll take that from both of you as, as a good recommendation for a follow-up. And might I just, I'm yeah, sorry, please. Mr. Chairman, just follow And just, I mean, I'm not trying to accuse you of, you know, doing anything, you know, untoward or not being, you know, Vested and involved in this process, but it just—it sounds to me like there is there is a disconnect here, for whatever reason. And I think that meeting in a smaller environment where people can sit down have much you know better it, it'd be much right. pro, much more valuable and efficient use of time um, would be you know a great idea. And I, I think it would it, it <coughs> potentially could go you know a long way towards um, allaying at least allaying some of the concerns. 
yeah. that the community has with regards to uh, this. Let's be honest, right? I'm not going to appease everybody. I know it, right? But at least we have some science, we have some basic facts behind what we do. Tom, can I just ask one follow up? Yeah, of course. Also, not intended to be disingenuous, but for what reason do you send that report to the DEC? I'm sorry? For what, what reason, reason do you yeah. send that report to the DEC? What's it, the reason? That it's a monthly I, requirement. I, I, can, I can talk about that. Yeah. So, um, but, but it's a requirement, but of the there's no... Well, well, you, go ahead. Yeah. As, par as part of the Speedies permit, um, every permittee is required to submit what we call a discharge monitoring report. So it's a monthly report of all their <coughs> discharges from the facility that are regulated under the Speedies permit. So it only shows uh, the affluent limits that are regulated under the New York State Speedies permit um, and the levels monthly that were discharged from the facility. And if there's anything that is um, notable in that, in that it's higher than normal or something unusual, what does, what's the role then for the DEC? If one of the limits in the speedies permit, if, if a, a, a discharge shows that the discharge is over the limit in the speedies permit, then we will advise the facility and then we have an enforcement process that we can take. We, we typically start with a notice of violation and then determine appropriate next steps. Yeah, uh, being from the county, we're very familiar with that $17,000 a day fine. <laughs> but, but that seems a little bit different than there's no role at all for New York State. To me. Yeah. So I don't think we're saying there's no role at all for New York State. I think that the, the <laughs> distinction is between radiological discharges and non-radiological discharges. And what we're talking about when we're talking about a speedies permit is non-radiological discharges. Sure. What John was referencing was radiological discharges. And based on what I've heard today, much of the community concern surrounds radiological discharges. Uh, understanding that, but they are sending you a report. I thought I heard yeah. that the radiological discharge is part of the report that they sent to the DEC. Is no. that, was that incorrect? Did I, I misunderstand? I, I know I send the, a monthly report. To the, the monthly DEC. report that comes to DEC only addresses the effluent limits that are in the speedies permit, well, which does not that. include radiological discharges. Kelly. Kelly. Uh, good. Hold, hold on a second. So, was uh, uh, there were a couple of people speaking at the same time? Was there a question? Another question from this side? Okay. John wanted to say something. Yeah. Rich, so do I have this? Am I understanding this correctly? There are reports that you send to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Environmental Protection Agency, two federal agencies. Is do I ha is that correct? Yeah, uh, annually. Right, and I assume you work hard to make sure that those reports are accurate. Absolutely. Because you want to be accurate and also because there's a federal requirement that they be accurate for enforcement purposes, right? Absolutely. And those reports are publicly available? Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Those reports are posted on the NRC's website on one web page, all the ones for Indian Point dating back to like 2005 or something right. like that. Both the annual report and the effluent report are there, as well as the groundwater protection report. Right. So, so the questions before were, what do we know about Unit 1 when they discharge to the river? Right? Those reports are available, all on the NRC webpage. Yeah. Right. I just want to do a time check for the group. Um, cause we wanted to try to have a stop at 9.30. That's a half an hour extra from what we were originally scheduled. That was meant to provide another public statement opportunity, which I'm still committed to, and I hope everyone was, is willing to stay a little beyond 9.30. Rich, I should still, stop right now. No. <laughs> the best part is yet to come, Rich. The best part is yet to come. So we, we, had, um, uh, d we had discussed uh, briefly at the last meeting NRC violations. Is that next on your, on your agenda? Because I, I thought that got short shrift at the last meeting, and it was a lesson learned for me that I want to ensure full transparency on any kind of NRC inspection activity, mm -hmm. um, citations, any state inspection activity that results in any kind of state action, and your response to it so the community can hear both what the violations were, 
what the corrective actions were, and ideally what the state um, is doing to follow up on those corrective actions. And so I do want to have that piece of the discussion, and I would like to try to do at least another few public speakers at the end, if that's okay with my fellow I DOB wanna, members. I just want to make a comment that's in follow-up to what all the other elected officials said, and that's to say that this community has concerns about the discharge of the water into the river, and the DOB will not have direct oversight of that because that's federal. And so I think I can transmit to at least Steve sitting right there. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to put you on the hot seat, um, but you are a representative from Senator Gillibrand's office. And I think the elected officials here would like to meet with you at some point to transmit this community's concerns to the federal level. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Rich Baroni, back to you. So I'll proceed with segmentation then. Um, you want me to jump to the violations? I think, I'm sorry, Steve, did you want to say something? Well, I just wanted to add, we don't have a seat at the DOB, so I just wanted to make that clear for everybody in the public who's here that federal representatives don't have a seat at the DOB. So we're not part of this, we're not allowed to be part of this committee meeting. We can participate by sitting here and observing and being on Zoom. We're not allowed to be part of the actual committee, but we'll be more than happy to meet with all of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Rich, I think on the segmentation, Dave and John, Rich, uh, Richard, do, do you think we should have this as, as a written submission and, and fellow DOB members, and then we, we could skip to the violations yeah. as the most important part for him to finish up? So, yeah, I think we should segment Rich's uh, pr presentation and go to the segment. violations. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead to the violations. Right, so if we go to page 24. Wow. <laughs> So we did receive a uh, NRC severity level four violation. It's equivalent to a green finding for operating reactors. It's not subject to enforcement action as long as it's placed into the corrective action program to prevent recurrence. A, uh, and a, yes, a severity level four NCV is the lowest level violation, very low safety significance documented in an inspection report. Uh, the NRC inspection reports document NCVs along with inspection activities and observations from the inspections. A notice of violation is different from an NCV. It's a written notice setting forth one or more violations of a legally binding requirement and normally requires a written response from the licensee and indicates some regulatory enforcement actions are required. In the inspection report dated November 17, 2022, uh, the NRC identified an NCV of very low safety significance of Title 10 uh, 10 CFR 20.1406, minimization of containment. And the details of that um, violation are as follows. The violation states that HDI did not have an adequate procedure or engineering controls to ensure that airflow would not escape the equipment hatch during radiological work as stated in engineering change, uh, ECIP, and there's the number there, VC hatch enlargement. The engineering change document stated that no airflow will travel outward of the enlarged equipment hatch area only inward. And the inspector questioned the site on monitoring and controls in place to execute the EC. Based on the NRC's question, uh, we correctly entered the issue of concern into our corrective action program. Um, the following corrective actions were generated in response to the uh, incident report. A smoke test was performed at five different elevations of the new equipment hatches on both containment buildings and covered the full height of both equipment hatches. The test results indicated no outward flow and indicated either no flow or inward flow at the number of elevation checkpoints. This result was not consistent with language in the engineering change, which stated only inward flow. And so we've revised the EC to reflect field conditions. Our ventilation systems were changed following the test results to further promote inward flow. Our procedures were revised to provide explicit direction to close or verify closed the equipment hatch during any work activities that could potentially generate airborne radionuclides. For example, uh, welding <coughs> construction activities and the internal transport of radioactive materials. This direction was initially provided in the station standard and now better resides in the procedure. The NSC inspector noted in the inspection report that no aggressive work that would be cutting or grinding was being performed at the time of the observation 
and inspectors noted that the air sample taken that day did not indicate any release of material. It should be emphasized that the NRC stated there was no release of radioactive material from containment. Additionally, no activities were performed at the time of the inspection that, have could, potent that could have potentially generated airborne material or contaminants with the hatch open. Only equipment that's been surveyed is clean or appropriately packaged can be transported out of the containment hatch. Again, while no other work is being done in containment that could generate airborne radionuclides. Uh, inside containment, a HEPA filter, local ventilation system is always employed to capture and control radionuclides and contaminants when work that could generate airborne radionuclides is performed, again with the hatch closed. So that would be a local um, HEPA filter um, at a welding activity. Engineering controls at the equipment hatch have always included HEPA filters in, at the ventilation systems, continuous air monitors, air sampler, and surveys directly outside the equipment hatch. At no time have radionuclides or contaminants left the building. Uh, the Reuters Stokes monitors located at the site boundary have never shown any increase in airborne activity. Uh, the NCV references a different site where reactive vessel, segment act reactive vessel segmentation activities resulted in radioactive particles in soil samples, which was likely attributed to a lack of a negative pressure in containment building. As directed by processes and procedure, <coughs> the IPEC equipment hatch is always closed during vessel segmentation work, and the monitoring of place confirms no release. That was before the NRC even inspected us. A discussion with the NRC Region 1 leadership was conducted on December 20th to discuss the NCV write-up and the inspection report. We acknowledge that the ECEC, which is the engineering change, could have been more explicit on expectations for controlling the hatch. We also acknowledge that a written procedure to control the hatch is preferred to a standard. Lastly, it should be enforced again that no time have radionuclides or contaminants left the containment building as confirmed with our site monitors. We have incorporated the corrective actions and lessons learned into our work practices and are confident that this issue has been adequately and thoroughly addressed. This was a good lesson learned for us. Uh, we further strengthened our defenses, made our standards more clear through the use of procedures. That's all I have for that violation. I think uh, Dave Flackbaum has a question. Yeah, you, mentioned, <clears throat> you mentioned lessons learned and the opportunity. Did those lessons include looking at why your team didn't find this problem before the NRC inspectors found it? Yeah. We, we, we could have been a better job there, Dave, admittedly. I mean, that's why we did the smoke test. Um, and like I said, up front, we should have done that. But at no time, again, we were pretty confident that at no time did we ever release anything out of containment? Yeah, I, right. I wasn't yeah. suggesting. I just. No, I got that. Okay, thank you. I understand. Richard. Well, as a follow up, what did you do to verify that there would be negative pressure before telling everybody at this meeting that there was negative pressure? We have uh, pressure indicators within our containment building that'll show us uh, its differential pressure across uh, roughing filters, right? So that DP will tell us if there's negative pressure going into the building, right? So we um, always had those, right? Uh, the roughing filters, some of them had to get changed, right? Because they did get clogged, just, just based on dust in, in the environment, right? But we've always had the roughing filter delta P's to verify that we had inward flow into containment. Right, but, it but just because you have an inward flow doesn't mean to say that there's an, a, if you have the hatch fully open that the whole of the hatch just has an inward flow. It means it's just a net inward flow, right? Some of it could be going out and some of it could be going in. Did you follow that one? The, no. With the hatch open, I think Richard is suggesting that the monitors you just referenced um, may be showing net negative pressure, but it's not measuring the flow of air through the hatch back and forth. But Richard, did I, I capture that correctly? Well, in other words, part of the air could be flowing in, in part of the hatch and out in a different part of right. the hatch. So there's net in, right. but there's outward right. flow as well. I, I'd have to look at it. Have to follow up. I'll follow up with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me just say that this has been a problem at Holtex facilities, which is that the design, the design documents over promise and then the actual implementation under-delivers. And but most of the solution to this, wait, 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 
Most of the solution to this seems to be to then change the over-promise in the design documents to then go back to what's actually happening. And I really think this is a very concerning thing for us to hear, and I'm glad that you admit that you could have done better on this, and I'd like you to really think about how you, how you must do better on this. Please do not come to this board again and tell us something which is factually incorrect. First of all, you made, you made a global statement that I, I don't know where you're getting the information yeah, from. Yeah, well, the design changes on the, right. on the um, casks, where design changes are made to the casks, which then turned out to be uh, design changes that were essentially, that needed NRC approval, which you hadn't asked for. What were the other ones, Dave? You're talking about the issue at San Onofre. Totally different than us. No, Oyster Creek. Where the worker was contaminated because of a change Holtec made, an unauthorized change. Oh, that was the uh, the valve, the um... vacuuming. It it just seems you've taken a global swipe out of every engineering change that Holtec does, with one or two examples. Well, I'm we saying can go, we can go further in talking about all the engineering okay. changes. Rich, why don't I you don't come... want to be competitive here? Okay, Rich, but... why don't you come next meeting with a list of all the violations that Holtec's had that are associated with design changes, and uh, we'll go over it. And let's see whether there's a pattern. If you want to do that, Mr. Webster, you're more than likely. More than, more than welcome to do it. Any other questions? Should you want to move on, Rich? Industrial safety? Yeah. Hey, we're really not proud of this one be honest with you, right? So a recent history, the New York State Department of Public Service, Office of Resilience and Emergency Preparedness submitted a letter uh, to us on November 14th with concerns of our industrial safety trend in Indian Point. The uh, letter cites concerns with near misses, fitness for duty testing, and a number of OSHA recordable entries. And a letter addressed to Mr. Wisely, uh, dated December 7th, we did respond that we appreciate and share the state's concern regarding industrial safety performance in Indian Point. Our response acknowledges two near misses and three OSHA recordables. Unfortunately, we now have a total of six. So to me, right, you really have to look at the cause of the events, right? So let's be clear that we know and acknowledge that no one comes to work wanting to get hurt, right? But we do need to address and understand the cause before we can put meaningful solutions in place. And with, so with that said, we looked at the cause of some of these issues. Uh, one was where wrong tooling was uh, used. Um, Poor oversight of the task at hand, uh, body posturing between eye-hand coordination, uh, pre-existing condition of the worker, uh, material condition of the facility, and, and that's one I take personally, I, I, I am personally accountable and responsible for, and one, uh, not meeting site standards. Those are basically the causes of the safety issues we've had. <coughs> so corrective actions to date, uh, we continue with safety discussions every day at pre-job briefs and station meetings. Uh, we'll continue with union-led safety committee meetings on a monthly basis. We, we solicit and we want to hear from union personnel what their issues are and we will resolve them as needed. We started issuing a station-wide red and yellow memo, memo addressing the event and distributing them site-wide. So when guys walk into work, if somebody got hurt, right, depending on the severity, it will be either a red memo or a yellow memo. This way it's a site correspondence throughout. <coughs> well, we established the Coach of the Week roster, right, where supervisors and managers will go out and observe a job. And then what they'll do is we'll report back, uh, we call it a leadership and alignment meeting, and we'll discuss what the supervisor and manager saw and any on-the-spot corrections we had to make. Um, we developed an expectations <coughs> document to be signed by all members of the leadership team as an acknowledgement to uphold station standards and expectations. Uh, we'll perform periodic craft labor safety walkdowns where we'll take a craft person with a, with a safety manager or, or a manager or any manager really and just ver watch a job to make sure all the safety precautions are being taken. And we'll perform periodic housekeeping walkdowns. So, one thing we did find was our, our housekeeping um, needed, um, need, needed to be uh, addressed. And so we've done that the last two weeks. 
Uh, we've committed ourselves to do that continuously. All right, we'll report back to that on a, uh, at the LNA meeting also. But I was disappointed in some of the housekeeping things we saw. Um, we need to maintain our standards, right? We need to maintain our standards in safety, and we need to maintain our standards in housekeeping. I, I've told all the guys that, everybody acknowledges that. Because we're a decommissioning plant, doesn't mean we let our standards go, right? And we're, we're reinforcing standards and making sure that they're kept. And I'm confident now with the corrective actions we've put in place, uh, our safety record will improve. I wish I could promise everybody in this room that nobody will get hurt the rest of the year. I wish I can. I can't. Well, all we could do is put these in place, and then if, some, if an event occurs again, we'll have to look at it in detail and see w what we can tweak to make things better. That's all I have for safety. Thanks, Rich. I think Dave has a question. Yeah. About seven or eight years ago, Exelon made a presentation at the NRC's Regulatory Information Conference on industrial safety, and they seem to have a very sound, robust program. So I was wondering, on issues like this, does Holtec do much benchmarking against industry practices to see if your standards and communications and stuff are at or above industry averages? I, 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 I'd have to pull that string. I know um, one of our major contractors is Champion. They have a whole safety team, right? So they look at some of their industry events at their other sites. Uh, Giordano does the same thing, right? Looking at safety precautions at their sites, other, other job opportunities there. So I would bank on them to give us anything that they need. But I'll pull the string to see if what we do with Holt. Fair enough. So. Thank you. Thank you. John, did you have anything? Um, So um, one of the things we did tonight in order to um, have more time for community discussion um, was to um, shrink down a discussion of uh, state oversight. Um, we do have slides. Um, they are on the website. I would recommend um, folks um, who are interested to go look at that. There are two things that I would like to just um, flag right now, and um, Tom, um, one of the things is, is, I think it's on the last, probably in the last page of the deck, we put it in here. Um, right, so um, I think, you know, we've had, a, we've had a very good, robust discussion tonight. One thing I want us to keep our mind, you know, keep our eye on is uh, the reduction of risk, the reduction of site-wide risk where there could be an airborne uh, migration of radiation. And, and, you know, NRC parlance, this is called a severe accident or beyond design basis accident. And the main site risk now uh, remains the spent nuclear fuel in the spent fuel pools. Um, I think there's, there's good news um, and there's also, you know, considerations to keep in mind going forward. And this slide shows what has happened, I believe, in the last 20 months. Um, since Holtec has taken over uh, the site uh, from Entergy. Um, Holtec, and, and I want to I acknowledge this uh, with, with Rich and his, his colleagues here, Holtec has moved a substantial amount of spent nuclear fuel out of the Unit 2 spent fuel pool and into dry cask. Make no mistake, that is reducing risk. That is reducing risk to the community. That's reducing risk to the emergency um, planning zone and to the New York metropolitan area. Um, that's 1.6 casks on average per month or 19.2 casks per year. That is much faster than what Entergy was doing and that what Entergy had, um, you know, had suggested. So that is, that is progress, that is risk reduction, um, and I, I think that's important to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, one other aspect is, um, I know, uh, assembly member Gallif had asked on a number of occasions, well, tell us about the exemptions. What are going on in the regulatory exemptions? This is where, um, a request is made to the nuclear regulatory commission. Oh, well, you have a generally applicable rule that you, you, um, promulgated through the administrative procedure act notice and comment. It applies generally to every single 
reactor site in the country, and then uh, various operators ask for an exemption from those rules. Um, the NRC, um, you know, has a process for an exemption. I think as we have discussed in the past, there is an exemption for the uh, post-defueled emergency preparedness plan, or PDEP. Um, that plan, that, that exemption plan, or that exemption request went in a while ago. Um, New York State submitted detailed comments on November 22nd, 2022. Those comments uh, were not posted by the NRC on publicly available atoms. Um, Tom has followed up, Tom Congdon has followed up with the NRC about this in a follow-up letter. I've posted both of them on the DOB website. Um, for folks who are interested in the exemption process, I would recommend you review that. And again, this is an exemption request to the federal agency, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And if folks have concerns about those exemption requests, I would suggest advocacy comments, letters to the NRC, to the NRC commissioners, to the NRC staff, um, and again, to federal elected uh, officials. What is, what is proposed is to reduce the emergency preparedness um, aspects uh, that protect the host community uh, around Indian Point. And given the first topic I was talking about, I would suggest that it, it is more than reasonable to maintain those emergency planning precautions until the last spent fuel assembly is out of the Unit 3 spent fuel pool. So there is progress. Risk is, re is being reduced, but risk is not zero. And those are two things to keep um, eyes on. Thank you, John. Um, I want to turn back to the public statement comments uh, and try to take at least the next five speakers, Tom, if you, if you could come back. You have, you gotta go. Okay. I, I understand if some of the DOB members need to, need to leave. We, we, we're 10 minutes past what I said we would, we would be, so uh, understand. But I do wanna uh, allow another five speakers to get onto the record, please. Absolutely, and, and we'll begin with uh, Tina. I understood you wanted to defer your time to now. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very concerned, um, you know, about the sinkhole in Yorktown and Enbridge's response and how there is, doesn't seem to be any urgency or oversight on the whole process. And I'm happy to hear that my electeds share that concern too, but it's sort of like, well, what are you gonna do about it? So when we, uh, the sinkhole happened, we contacted expert, you know, Rick Cooperwitz about it. And he said, you know, of course, you gotta check the integrity, just what Enbridge is doing, and also the welds. Is there any mention of the welds? No. So when the pipeline was being built, a lot of us looked and watched this process going on and looked at parts of the, what the DEC requires for good practices in building this thing. And I mean, we have a record of it on their docket and everything else. And we just didn't have the oversight through the DEC for a lot of what happened with this pipeline, and especially in Blue Mountain. You wanna see problems and erosion and everything else? You wanna see a bunch of violations? Go to the pipeline you know, segment in, in, in Blue Mountain and take a look at that. So the fact that this sinkhole happened was just not a surprise for us. So I've asked this board in my community presentation about the pipelines next to Indian Point and the integrity management systems. And so the integrity management systems of these pipelines is really about like how are problems looked at and how are they found. This problem with the sinkhole was reported by somebody walking their dog on December 24th. So that tells you what Enbridge's integrity management system really is. So in my community presentation, I pointed out the fact that the National Transportation Safety Board has cited FIMSA and Enbridge 
Okay, they've, 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 side, they've made recommendations to them because you see, there's really no oversight and we really don't have any teeth here as we're seeing with some of these federal agencies and regulations, okay? So the Nash, look at, take a look at what the National Transportation Safety Board, or you can watch my community presentation again, and at the very end, the recommendations that they make. They make recommendations to Enbridge's integrity management systems, and they also make a recommendation about uh, FIMS's evaluations of the PIRs. You have and that's 30 the, seconds left. By the okay, way. that's the potential impact price. So, you know, the DE, the D, <laughs> on FIMSA, had, you know, with the ORNL risk assessment that's posted on the DPS website, and everything, it's just like they do not have these recommendations in them. So in terms of a risk assessment, it's really not a risk assessment because the real risks that FIMSA has found and are probably going to become policy in what, two years or whatever, are not being applied to the pipelines next to Indian Point. And so in the risk assessment, so... Tina, it, Tina I apologize, yeah. uh, we're at three minutes. I know, I'm out of time. But anyway, I just wanted to hear what em Enbridge was going to say. And, you know, it's just very disappointing. And again, to hear about oversight that should be happening, and it should be happening through our government, really. And it's that, you know, industry determines all of these things, really, and, and policy and regulations. And, you know, here we are in the same boat. And it would be great to hear public safety and you know, public health mentioned on the same lines as the spreadsheet, you know, the financial spreadsheet and the same, with the same kind of urgency that, you know, decommissioning is, you know, the deadline for that. All right, thanks, that's it. Thank you. Uh, next, next we'll, we'll move back to the Zoom participants. Uh, uh, I believe it's Mary Inouye. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you so much. I'm a resident of New York City, and I'd like to express my concerns and a strong opposition to Holtec's proposed dump of radioactive wastewater in the Hudson River. I'm concerned that such dumping can negatively affect the health of local communities and the sustainability of the environment. As other speakers mentioned, um, there is no safe dose of ionizing radiation. All exposures are cumulative, and some isotopes are extremely long-lived. And I'd like to emphasize that dumping of radioactive wastewater cannot be and should not be justified on the ground that treated water or other radioactive wastewater is routinely dumped by nuclear power plants and other nuclear facilities. I would also like to draw your attention that the whole text proposed dump is a direct threat to a universal human right to access a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. A universal human right to access a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment was declared in the historic resolution that was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in July last year. And the resolution calls upon not just governments, but also business enterprises to scale up efforts to ensure a healthy environment for all. In regard to tritium, there was a scientific report published in December 2013 in the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity. In the report, the report is called Current Understanding of Organically Bound Tritium, OBT, in the Environment. And in this report, scientists highlighted that unlike for treated water, the environmental quantification and behavior of organically bound tritium are not well known. Therefore, any plants related to the discharge of tritium and radioactive material into the environment should be avoided based on the precautionary principle that Dr. Um, Fable um, highlighted. And I believe that a New York decommissioning oversight board recognizes its social responsibility to call for precautionary measures in order to protect the seconds. public from exposure to harm. As Holtec's proposed action has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public and the environment. 
I strongly hope that the New York Decommissioning Oversight Board takes necessary steps to ensure that radioactive wastewater from the spent fuel form of the Indian Point will be stored on site, such as in the robust containers with leak prevention and leak detection functions, instead of evaporating into the environment or dumping into the Hudson River or shipping it to the other communities. Thank that's you so much. that's oh, thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to offer uh, Steve from Senator Gillibrand's office. Yes, thank you. So, hi, I'm Steve Coleus. I'm Senator Gillibrand's Hudson Valley Regional Director. I want to thank Dr. Becker for what he uh, had said. And I just wanted to say to Mr. Sipos as well, we don't have a seat at this table. This is a, and so the public knows, the federal representatives do not have a seat on the DOB. Yeah. So we don't have an opportunity to respond to these questions from constituents, from, from individuals here. But I wanted to respond to Dr. Becker that we are more than happy to meet with anybody who has a question about this. But we cannot and we're not allowed to sit at the table to have this, to be part of this discussion unless I signed up to do this exactly what I'm doing, publicly speaking and asking questions. Thank you, Steve. So I, I just want to actually clarify, my, my comments were um, about federal representatives were in the vein of as um, legislative oversight of two federal agencies, um, not necessarily, you know, within the four square corners of, of the decommissioning oversight board, but um, these are federal agencies and, you know, perhaps there's opportunities for oversight. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Is this not allowed? Is it not allowed by the federal government or not allowed by our? No, it's, it, the DOB is a, st it's a state oversight entity. It was created by a state agency and we, we established the membership through the bylaws. So that's what he's referring to. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, next we have Sally Jean Gellert on Zoom. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, tell you what, my notes are really scrabbled. I'll uh, send a written comment. Thank you. Save time. Thank you. Next we have Joel uh, Gingold. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the board for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Joel Gingo. I live in Croton on Hudson, where I'm a member of the uh, Village Sustainability Committee and also serve as a client or the Climate Environment Chair for Cohope Indivisible. Oh, and, and I spent about a 60 year career as a consulting nuclear engineer uh, through the commercial nuclear power industry. Uh, first, I am unalterably opposed to the dumping of the water into the Hudson for a variety of reasons, uh, most of which have already been expressed by others. I won't repeat them. I would also point out that the Hudson is not really a river. Uh, for much of the year, it's a tidal estuary, and the waters in the river slosh up and down and rarely get discharged into the ocean. So whatever goes into the river will probably stay there for quite a long time. Uh, my preferred method uh, for the disposition of the water would be to solidify it and bury it. I, I would point out uh, to those who have concerns with this, many of the radioactive components from this plant and all the other plants that are being decommissioned are shipped to areas, usually in the West, Texas, Idaho, wherever, and they are buried. So there will be a great deal of material from India Point that will be buried in the West. To add uh, whatever this will require, the material will be solidified, the bad actors will be immobilized, the whole thing will be buried with the other waste from the plant. I believe the storage of liquid on the site for 50 or 100 years is not a great idea, again, for reasons that have been mentioned by others. But the one thing I would like to point out I have not heard mentioned, that Holtec has faced this identical issue at a Pilgrim plant in Massachusetts. 
Everybody in the area is opposed to their dumping water into Cape Cod Bay, starting with Senator Edward Markey and Senator Warren, to the state officials in Massachusetts and the local officials, and the community groups and the environmental groups and the individuals who live in that area. And Holtec insists that they are going to do it despite what anyone says. And I fear that we are going to face the same issue here. And if I may segue uh, from this point. You, uh, just a uh, quick interruption. You only have about 15 seconds left. OK, well, I, I will save that for another time. Don't, don't dump it in the river. Thank you. Uh, we have Thank we're going you. we're going to get to one final uh, uh, public speaker, uh, Teresa Cardos, who's joining via Zoom. And following Ms. Cardos, we'll outline some other public statement opportunities. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Uh, as an environmental educator and uh, field biologist. I feel very strongly that Holtec should not be dumping the, uh, the, uh, the spent uh, 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 pool water into the Hudson River. In addition to all the points everybody else uh, uh, made, uh, I would like to remind everybody that uh, climate change is stressing ecosystems and wildlife, and we are also currently <coughs> when there is a serious and alarming decline in, in wildlife species. We're almost at, uh, at a species a extinction, and uh, every little stressor is important, and we should not be doing this. Um, I'm also morally opposed to our uh, putting a burden on, on other states and uh, the transport of, of our nuclear uh, waste uh, can not only be a, a risk in the transport if, if there's some kind of accident, but I mean, that's also uh, the transport increases uh, 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 greenhouse uh, gases. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I am also really concerned about the uh, request for an exemption for for uh, an emergency preparedness uh, plan uh, that should at least be in place um, until uh, the, the last um, uh, 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 spent fuel is transferred, especially considering that there are, there, there's a geological fault in the area and the two uh, uh, gas pipelines. Uh, you know, it's just we, we really need an emergency preparedness plan. I also agree that we should have a permanent medical expert um, on, on the panel. And I'm probably nearing the end of my time period. So um, other comments, I guess I will submit in writing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, do we have a slide to uh, present? Yes, great. So um, folks can uh, still submit written comments via the Indian Point website. Um, there are instructions here on the slide. Um, we encourage folks to submit questions. Um, and we take questions through the Q&A and, &A and uh, uh, recorded these. I see 72 or so. Um, we will endeavor to have all of those answered before the next meeting of the DOB. Next slide, please. Um, we encourage folks to sign up uh, for updates. Um, these are the instructions on how to uh, subscribe to our document library and our service list. Um, I understand it can be a bulky process, but it's well worth it. and. Uh, we can assist you if you're having technical difficulties getting on. Next slide, please. Um, again, just a reminder of the website for the DOB, dps.ny.gov slash Indian Point. Um, there's a wealth of information there. And our next meeting will be on April 27th, 2023. Um, as we said before, uh, during this meeting, we're also going to look for some times 
uh, for the school monitoring working group to coordinate with the school and find time to meet with parents in the school community. Um, and with that, I will adjourn tonight's meeting. Thank you all very much.